director's reports, however you want to say it. Um, and we start off with <clears throat> Director George, Colorado River Basin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Let me start out by thanking um, Director Gallagher for putting together the tour with the Upper Yampa Conservancy District and Kevin McBride. Uh, it, it was uh, really fun to finally have a chance to go up and see Stagecoach. I've looked at it from a distance and I've had, had kind of an impression of how it worked. And, and of course, I'm, I'm a student of John Fetcher, uh, as everyone is in this part of the place. He's a giant among men. And so I had always listened with fascination when he was describing in those early years how and why this was all getting put together. So it was very nice to go see that and to, and to hear more about it and to see the beautiful place that Stagecoach sits. And to my surprise, quite a number of homes and, and users right up in the high country that isn't a common phenomenon. I guess it's getting to be more so, but I didn't realize that, that all of that was at play. Then we uh, were able to, to look at the uh, proposed new site of uh, a small reservoir that will really enhance the uh, performance of Stagecoach and really, really make a difference, I think, in, in uh, this watershed. So um, it, it just has a lot going for it. So that may show up here another day, uh, I would hope. Uh, for Grant, and I think it would just fit our uh, mission beautifully. So uh, I did thank Kevin, but you do you can do it again next time. You see, he he was um, really fun to listen to, and and uh, really loves his work, loves his job. Uh, maybe loves the chairman of his uh, board. I don't know. Uh, uh, it depends on when it's time to uh, get the bonus, I guess, Ken. So. Anyway, thank you for uh, having all of that happen for those of us who were able to, to do that. Uh, let's see. Um, the uh, I, I'm not going to spend any time talking about the drought on the Colorado River. I, I think we've probably pretty much uh, gotten current on most of those issues, uh, other than to tell you uh, you, you just, it doesn't matter where you go in, in western Colorado, you can just feel the depth of the drought. Uh, even here, and I know there was more moisture early in the year, but you still feel uh, and, and, of course, see uh, the uh, er aridification that appears to be happening. And that, that is probably the the most worrisome piece of this whole thing, if that really is to, to bear out, because it just changes everything in, in this beautiful part of the world. But we'll, we'll take it on as best we can, and, and I think um, uh, we are doing everything we can, and we'll continue to do that. We just need some help from above that we can't control. So uh, Basin Roundtable, Colorado Basin Roundtable, has its regular meeting uh, on uh, Monday in uh, Glenwood Springs. The, um, I think about the only item on the agenda, at least the main item, is probably a continuation of the conversation we've, we've been having. Uh, and Brent, I think, is still planning to come, and I don't know who, who else, but I'm certainly going to go. And, and we'll, we'll just continue... Uh, the education component of what we're doing, and I think uh, we'll be just fine. Uh, the other big thing going on uh, in um, our area is the Middle Colorado uh, Watershed Management Plan, and you remember uh, this when they were here and we funded a couple components of this that the, it's kind of a neglected part of the Colorado River, and I, and I could explain why it's neglected, be, because it has to do with uh, topography as well as hydrology, but it's, uh, the, the boundaries are the uh, east end of Glenwood Canyon through the south end of Debec Canyon. So you only have to drive through there once to understand the topography of the Middle River. And of course, the, 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 those two canyons um, were the control factor 
for how that area was settled. Uh, the, the Utes loved it because nobody else was around, and, and there was a lot of protection for them, certainly in the winter. Uh, but uh, they, they also uh, en enjoyed the flat tops. For the um, immigrants that came in, uh, it was really tough to get into everything between those two canyons. So the people who first came in were the people who were already in the high country, having been in the mining uh, industry. And so a lot of them were coming in from the Leadville Aspen side, come through what we know as Colburn today, and then come down in into the, the river between the canyons. Same thing with all the activity down in Telluride, Ure area as uh, the economy was changing, then they were coming up. Uh, many of them would go to Grand Junction, which, of course, is the uh, outer or the, the western end. But many of them also came in over the, the uh, Grand Mesa. And so uh, th there's just a whole uh, fun story in all of that. And, and they um, had the questionable judgment of actually asking me to tell this story at their uh, organizational meeting. and. Uh, I guess I still have the old George family ability to tell a story, so I'll probably do it again, uh, like now. So any, anyway, the, the, the other interesting piece that's going to happen, you'll remember this, this particular area came to us in two components, two different groups. We had the folks who are more attuned to the work of a watershed management concept, and then you had the... Um, conservation districts uh, ag point of view and there was some you know, discussion early on about how to blend those two uh, maybe somewhat disparate missions so the way it was done is that that both of them funded separately they intend to run parallel do the the, the work study uh, parallel I think they've hired uh, staff and uh, consultants separately. So at the first organizational advisory committee meeting a couple of weeks ago, that question was posed directly of, wait a minute, are, are we sure this is the right way to do this? Because when do we blend them and how do we blend them? And we must blend them. The, the, they must work together. So there is that extra little interesting challenge. And so I'm, I'm going to watch that and, and uh, participate as much as I can, because I think we can do it. I know most of the people involved. And it'll just be a microcosmic example of what we've been trying to say about collaboration gets a better result. So stay tuned. Uh, that's it for me today. I'm going to save time so that uh, Heinz can get us out of here early. Uh, <laughs> I, I only have the other usual thing. If anyone asks for it, I can certainly, yeah, certainly yeah. tell you. Yeah. It so I'm, I, I, it wouldn't, that. thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is a special day because the new 2019 Old Farmer's Almanac is out. The new, oh, and, and they still predict the weather the same as they did 120 years ago. Maybe it's even more than that, 200 years ago. And they're just as right today <laughs> as they were then. And so um, I want to tell you, I'm, this is the first time you've heard this good news, but I know what the weather's going to be like for the winter of 2018 to 2019 for Colorado. This is, they're defining winter to be this November through next March. And so for the southwest part of the state, it will be cold and wet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or not. Or not. Or not. That's for dark. For, Don't for the, say that, Russ. <laughs> for, the, for the northwest, and this looks like it's right along the I-70 line, so you, you know they couldn't have made this up because they didn't have the, the I-70 line <laughs> when they started this. Anyway, um, mild and snowy for the northwest. Then it looks like the cold and wet of the southwest does go about halfway into the southeast quadrant. Uh, and, and more than down the front range in the northeast. 
and uh, but uh, otherwise I'd say about the east third of the state is in the color of warm and dry. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So there, all the news Sorry. that's fit to print. <laughs> All right, thank you, Director George. Any questions for Director George? All right, we'll continue on with Director Hawkins, San Juan, San Miguel, and Dolores River Basin. I've really enjoyed being here in Steamboat. I'm sorry I didn't get here in time to go on the tour, uh, which I'm sure I would have enjoyed if I had been here. Uh, it was a lovely drive up through the state, although, it struck me that every reservoir that I drove by was very low on the way up. Um, I do wanna spend a little time talking about the continued drought conditions in the Southwest. I won't harp on it, we've talked about it a lot. Um, I think we're all watching the forecasting for the winter very closely. I'm glad to hear Russ's report today, um, but- Go with that one. We'll go, we'll go with that one. Um, the storage reservoirs in our area really carried some of our irrigators and water users through the year. And if we don't get a fairly good refill, I think that next year is going to be even more challenging for us. Um, with the low flows and um, the hot temperatures, we're seeing fish and wildlife suffering. We talked a little bit about some of the impacts from the 416 fire last time, but I would say across the board, um, we're seeing some problems, um, especially for aquatic species. The rivers are very, very low. The temperatures are very warm. Um, and so it, it is a concern um, and has led to um, things like the need to call some of the agencies in stream flow water rights in some of our basins. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about, I know that we had talked about there being some concern that some of the domestic users would start losing their wells, especially in the La Plata and the Florida basins. And I'm hearing anecdotally from folks that I know that live out there that they are indeed losing their wells. So people are hauling water. There are still some restrictions on hauling, but, um, you know, that really impacts families when they can't get domestic water to their houses and their livestock and they've got to make alternative plans. So I feel for those folks and hope that we can get the groundwater recharged next year and, and hopefully get their wells back working. Our next Basin Roundtable meeting is coming up in October. I think we're going to have a full agenda, including having some of the staff um, from the CWCB there to continue our discussion from yesterday. So really looking forward to having folks down there. We also get to have the IBCC meeting in Durango in October. So it's gonna be an exciting month for us down there. I wanted to spend the rest of my director's report talking a little bit about stream management planning efforts that are going on out of our round table in the Southwest. Um, so in our Basin Implementation Plan, we identified stream management planning as one of the potential mechanisms to get our arms around environmental and recreational needs, which are not very well known um, in any of our tributaries in the Southwest. Um, so we launched a pilot on the San Miguel River um, and what we learned during that pilot process is that trying to get the technical work done before the stakeholder work um, didn't work, even though you know the consultant who was doing the technical work was very qualified and there were great folks working on it. What we were hearing, especially from the agricultural community, is that they wanted the stakeholder group to be engaged in the technical work as well as the opportunities work. So we're in the process of sort of taking a pause in that pilot process. And one of the things we'll be talking about at the round table is reworking a stakeholder group that has broader participation from the agricultural community. I'll be co-leading it with one of the irrigators um, in the Nucleo Natarita area. 
Um, and we need to make sure that we're taking time to better understand all of the values within the watershed, help forge some discussions between the upper and lower watershed, which don't always see eye to eye on the San Miguel, um, and then make sure that we can vet the technical report and talk about opportunities. Um, so we're really learning as we're going and just wanted to mention that the water commissioner on the San Miguel, Mark Ragsdale, has been very helpful in, in the process. He's really engaged in the community and um, hopefully he will be able to at least assist us with some information during that process. Um, and sort of learning from that experience, there's a new effort in the Upper San Juan. It is not called a stream management planning effort anymore. The group decided that watershed enhancement partnership was more appropriate for what we were trying to do in the group. Right now, the steering committee has been meeting. There's been great participation from ranchers, municipal users, local technical consultants, parks and wildlife, conservation groups, and the Division of Water Resources. And again, I want to mention that Joe Crabb, who is in Division 7 has been very helpful, um, at great at getting information into that steering committee, so thanks. Um, and the steering committee will then open up into some stakeholder and public meetings, and so the whole process there is really designed to make sure that the stakeholder group is set before any of the technical work is launched. So. Um, I'll really look forward to participating in both of those and understanding if there's appetite for doing more planning in the other tributaries. So I'll leave it at that and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Director Hawkins. Any questions? All right, we'll continue to move on. The Gunnison River Basin, Director Anderson. Uh, Thank you, uh, Jim. Um, the uh, the drought in my basin, uh, you know, has changed uh, changed a lot of operations, and and it'll definitely take years to to get back to to where we were prior to this year. Um, uh, some comments about areas in the in the in the basin, the Upper Gunnison, of course, my involvement there is primarily with. Uh, with Taylor Dam, but there is a Taylor local user group that's made up of uh, ranchers, farmers in the Upper Gunnison, uh, the uh, lake fishermen, and the stream fishermen, and the and uh, and homeowners in that uh, in in that Taylor River country. Uh, the operation of of the reservoir is. Uh, is under a 1975 agreement and a court decree. Uh, one of the big issues we're facing uh, is the decision of how to operate that reservoir through the winter. Um, there's some uh, friction there between uh, uh, concern for that uh, fishery in the Taylor River below the reservoir. Uh, would like to see higher releases, and, and of course, the most of the balance of the people would would like to store water. So uh, I think we'll reach an uh, amiable conclusion. But uh, uh, as as far as the Upper Uncompahgra, uh, uh, the, the Conservation Board approved a, a grant for a watershed study up there. I think many of you know Marty Whitmore. She's heading it. Uh, I attended kind of their kickoff uh, scoping meeting uh, for the group up there. Uh, it, it's very interesting to me. It hits on several points. Uh, they're going to look at uh, doing some modeling. Also look at the very preliminary uh, study of a uh, new reservoir uh, with the ability to um, feed uh, Ridgeway Reservoir out of Cow Creek. Uh, the other thing that uh, I think is very key is that they're uh, going to look at doing some preliminary designs to get them to the point that they'd be able to go out for grants 
for some of the diverters, some of the, the uh, irrigators there. And uh, basically, the diversions up there uh, look the same way they did 100 years ago. They're, uh, they're open ditches running across the uh, uh, cobble so that uh, they get, uh, they get to, to irrigate with a small fraction of what they actually diverted. It's interesting. The other thing that's that's interesting as they become more efficient. That uh, that's good for for my organization immediately below, as we'll have the opportunity to to uh, use some of that water that uh, they didn't. Um, a similar thing can be said for. For for my organizations, uh, we've been uh, fortunate to use uh, salt and selenium money to uh, pipe and and line the east side of the project through the Manca Shell. The west side of my project has has been neglected uh, essentially, and and we're in the same boat that the irrigators in the upper Rio Campagra are. Uh, The uh, turning my attention to the North Fork, uh, they were no doubt the hardest hit in the Gunnison Basin. Uh, uh, I I believe that the orchards in the area have been able to keep their trees alive. Uh, the the uh, uh, forage crops, though, are are pretty much non-existent up there. Uh, lower on Compagra, turning to turn my attention there. Uh, uh, my project is operating at 60 percent. Uh, we we, uh, we cut the uh, percentage uh, over a month ago as we run out of our storage in, in Ridgeway. Uh, and uh, I, the plan is not to relax that percentage but to uh, as uh, the uh, demand decreases, uh, will cut uh, the diversion from the Gunnison River through the tunnel. Uh, so far, we've been able to cut a, a hundred second feet out of, uh, of what was uh, something like 1,050. So we're down to a diversion of 950. Um, there have been no water restrictions uh, in the cities of Montrose, uh, Olathe, and Delta. Uh, I say this, uh, it provided a benefit to us. Uh, we starved for water in Uncompagra this year, and as they increased uh, their demand, uh, uh, we uh, our uh, exchange credits increase to Ridgeway Reservoir, so uh, they utilize uh, uh, water from from our Gunnison diversion through the tunnel to uh, supply what's termed Project Seven, which uh, feeds the uh, water uh, domestic water suppliers in the valley as uh, the weather was hot, uh, this water being used to keep uh, the bluegrass green was uh, a thousand uh, acre feet more than uh, what is typically exchanged. So uh, that that helped us this year. It, uh, I say it was some mix, mix of emotions because uh, coming to work uh, when the sprinklers are still running and Half of them are uh, water and Highway 50 uh, in the Green Belt and and other things around the valley. It's uh, th there's uh, definitely room for some improvements there. Um, I would like to uh, recognize Jason Ullman, uh, uh Kevin. Uh, Jason is the assistant uh, division engineer in the Gunnison. Uh, he uh, basically took it upon himself uh, to uh, update uh, the Gunnison accounting spreadsheet. Uh, this is uh, 
used daily by us to see where what our storage looks like and and so forth um and uh, essentially develop from scratch a uh accounting spreadsheet for Lincoln Pogger and, and Ridgeway Reservoir. And, and I salute him and thank him very much for those efforts. Uh, uh, they're available on the website and, and anybody can, uh, on the division's left site, and anybody can go have a, have a look at it and uh, see what the situation is. Uh, Monday uh, was the Gunnison Basin Roundtable meeting. Uh, With the help of the River District and and Dave Kanzer, uh, we have a uh, modern, uh, well thought out uh, website now. Uh, if you do some searching on the internet, I'm sure you can find it. And, and I thank Dave for his efforts there. Uh, the other item uh, discussed was. Uh, Cyril Reservoir. Uh, it's been red flagged by uh, the state engineer for for stability reasons, and and uh, essentially the outlook outlet works has deteriorated beyond the point of repair. So it's it's a major reconstruction effort uh, undertaken by the city of Montrose that un, owns that reservoir, and we had a uh, presentation of, of of what that work involves. Uh, I suspect we'll be seeing a uh, a grant application for for that work. Uh, uh, I think I'll just leave it to say that there was a long discussion of the issues on the Colorado River Basin there. <laughs> um, I did attend the uh, Water Congress. Uh, Again, a lot of discussion of the uh, issues on the Colorado Basin. Uh, uh, Jim Yon and, and uh, Patty Wells both spoke there, as did uh, Brent Newman. Uh, uh, Patty, I certainly appreciated your comments. Uh, uh, and uh, she's, uh, she knows the history of uh, Denver water because she's uh, Live quite a bit of it and certainly enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, attended the uh, Colorado River uh, Conservation District's annual meeting. Um, and I'd uh, say similar things about my good friend here, Russ George. Yeah, his remarks were uh, very well uh, spoken. Uh, uh, he didn't get the press of some of the remarks there, but uh, <laughs> he was definitely the uh, same voice in the room. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd also uh, like to salute you. I think the governor found a very deserving uh, citizen for his award. Thank you. Uh, I've been uh, discussing features on the uh, on my pro uh, project, on Compagra project. Uh, this slide is a slide of the diversion dam uh, in the in just up upstream of the uh, Black Canyon National Monument. Uh, if you look in the right hand corner, you can see the smoke stack from what was a coal fired steam. Um, compressor um, uh, station for for the uh, air to drill the tunnel. Uh, the diversion dam, I think you can make it out there. Uh, the hole that you see in about the center of the slide is the access uh, to the tunnel. And then on the left side, uh, you can see uh, the diversion gate for uh, for that uh, tunnel, just okay. Uh, the the diversion dam was built in uh, in uh, 1911. That's some two and a half years after uh, the Gunnison Tunnel was completed. Uh, 
President Taft visited uh, Montrose in 1909, and they had quite a showing of him turning the valve to turn on the Gunnison Tunnel, but actually what he would signal the guys inside the tunnel to turn loose some spring water <laughs> so that uh, it would come on, on through the tunnel. Um, the uh, it, it, It's over 100 years old. Uh, it's uh, 240 feet long, five and a half foot tall. It's a timber crib dam. It was, uh, they utilized Oregon fir from the Northwest to uh, build a dam. And amazingly enough, that uh, crib is still in fairly good shape after uh, after 100 years. Um, we do, uh, there's another picture of it as it looks today. Uh, of course, this uh, the air compression station is gone. Uh, the uh, structure uh, just to the uh, left of center is the uh, Sluice Gate House. It's interesting to note that uh, uh, the Bureau called it a Sluice Gate and Fish uh, Way, uh, even in uh, the early 1900s. This is a, a picture of it. It has uh, deteriorated significantly over time. Uh, the water, the Uncompahgre Association is is faced with uh, with uh, having to do a, a repair here. This is a, a picture looking upstream. Uh, crystal dams a uh, mile and a half, two miles upstream of the diversion dam. Uh, the top of the dam is, is fitted with an A-frame uh, that you can stand up and, and gain about uh, six additional feet uh, in height uh, prior to uh, the Aspinall unit and Crystal Dam. Uh, it was... Uh, regularly lowered and raised as as uh, as the runoff come down uh, the Gunnison River. This is a, another picture of uh, standing close to uh, where the t tunnel water would leave the river to the tunnel. What's shown here are uh, fish deterrents. Uh, when we developed the uh, hydro on the uh, South Canal, uh, these were installed to uh, protect the fish from getting uh, tied up in uh, the turbines. Um, the, uh, they work somewhat, I would say. Uh, they, they do a good job with the larger fish. Uh, the smaller fish tend to come on through, but the smaller fish uh, can uh, pass through the turbines with, with little problems for themselves. Uh, the fishery in the uh, South Canal is still uh, doing well, Lynn, and uh, uh, we operate the tunnel uh, uh, after the irrigation season a couple uh, times a month to uh, bring about a hundred second foot through for uh, uh, the domestic water supply. And that, uh, just another picture of, of uh, that facility there. Uh, with that, uh, uh, I might mention that uh, the Bureau's uh, tally of the cost for the construction of, of this facility was $115,000. <laughs> I suspect we will, uh, my organization will spend uh, a considerable portion of that just acquiring the permits to uh, <laughs> repair the sluice gate. Uh, with that, uh, I'll, I'll conclude my remarks. All right. Thank you, Director Anderson. Any questions for Director Anderson?
All right, we have Director Trick, who I don't get to see very much. There she is. Um, uh, the North Platte. I have a couple of slides. <coughs> Do you want to get rid of the mic? Okay, something like Good morning. I will try to keep it short today. Um, I would like to thank, first of all, our hosts and Director Gallagher. I did not get to attend the tour on Monday. However, I will be attending a tour this afternoon with uh, Jay Skinner for an R2 cross uh, demonstration. So if anybody was not aware of that and, and wants to join us after the meeting, um, it will be accessible and, and pretty brief, but uh, you guys should uh, join us if possible. And so similar to Director George not wanting to talk about drought, I would rather not talk about fire, however, uh, that seems to be the latest news. Um, we did have a fire called the Ryan Fire start on the 15th, um, so just last week. And according to the steamboat pilot, actually, which reported on this fire, um, it actually grew from about 500 acres to about 1,800 acres in the course of one day. Um, so as you'll see on that slide, the, the fire at the very top, that's the Ryan fire and that's in our North Platte Basin. And I, I just zoomed out because also many of you probably saw or drove past a huge uh, incident management camp on the way up here. And that was for the Silver Creek fire, which is pretty close to us and is in Grand County and part of Route County it appears to have um, crossed the county line into route. Um, that began back in July, and it is now the size of around 13,000 acres, 35% contained as of yesterday. And the Ryan fire that just started up in our basin is 0% contained as of yesterday. So we're pretty worried about that. It's also crossed into Wyoming. Um, so the, I think the incident uh, command center is being run out of encampment currently, but um, uh, I don't know if the Almanac there has any fire predictions for next summer, but we would like to see, see no fires, <laughs> hopefully. Um, <laughs> Um, but unfortunately, because of the state of the forest health and the beetle kill timber, there's a lot of fuel. Um, I, I believe that the Silver Creek fire was started from lightning, um, from what I could tell from the, the website. And they still are investigating the cause of this, this Ryan fire, the one that just started on the 15th. So um, stay tuned for any information on that. And so I just uh, pulled a couple of pictures so that's the one of the la location maps that the incident uh, into web website has posted. The larger red border there is the closure area, and part of the closure area is going to affect uh, one of the hunting big game hunting units up there in the North Platte uh, Unit One Sixty One, um, which uh, I don't know if a lot of you know, but hunting season and the hunting economy and, and the, you know, the economic activity that hunting brings is one of the things that our basin relies upon. So any fires or closures or things that cause disruptions to that is going to affect our economy up there. Um, this was a picture on the 16th from the InsaWeb website, just kind of showing some of the fire pictures there. Um, that one was taken on the 17th. And switching to more uh, positive news, I just wanted to share with everyone a something that happened up in August in the North Platte. It, it's become an annual tradition. It's called the Sky's the Limit Hot Air Balloon Festival. And if you guys haven't ever gone to that, it's kind of a neat, neat event. So 
it was around, I think it was August 11th and 12th. That usually happens the first couple of weekends in August near that time period um, where a, a lot of hot air balloon enthusiasts <coughs> come and fly their balloons. And so these are a few pictures of that from this past year. And they usually launch from the school football field there in Walden. And this, this past event happened to have perfect weather, almost no wind, uh, clear skies. And so it, it was a uh, quite a success. And there's just some cool pictures that the Jackson County star, the local newspaper uh, shared with me from that event. And if, if you do happen to go, they, will let you be on a crew. And if you decide to volunteer and be on a crew, sometimes they will give you a ride in the balloons. So it's pretty neat. And that photo was some balloons launching. So that is one of the more interesting and unique uh, events that we, we have up there. And moving on to roundtable news, the roundtable the, their last meeting was in May, so um, they have not met since our last meeting or last update that I provided, but they are having a meeting Tuesday from 3 to 5 at the Forest Service building on Main Street in Walden. Um, if anybody is around and wants to come to the meeting, they certainly welcome anyone that wants to join in, and they will be considering a WSRF application at that meeting um, from Ducks Unlimited called the North Park Irrigated Meadows Conservation Program. And I think that's kind of it. Um, like I said, I'll make it short. And I just wanted to share a picture that I took of one of our awesome sunsets Hi. on the 8th of September, I believe. So, and that was from the, the backyard of, of Mr. Carl Trick. <laughs> and that's it all right for me. thank you director trick any questions for director trick okay um because he is the hosting person here director gallagher i'm uh, moving my time to the end so that he doesn't always feel pressured like he has to get through <laughs> everything and also i feel his pain as being uh, y for the Yampa at the end of the alphabet. So being yawn all my life, I was always at the end. So I wanted to give that to Director Gallagher. So Director Gallagher, the Yampa, white and green. I most appreciate it, Director Yan. Uh, and I appreciate your sympathy for the letter Y. <laughs> it's great to hear, hear an empathetic voice once in a while. <laughs> um, <coughs> I was, uh, thank you, Director uh, Trick. Um, I was climbing uh, Hans Peak with my wife last Sunday uh, when I saw, looked over my shoulder and saw this tiny wisp of smoke about 15 miles to the northeast. And <coughs> then five minutes later, it looked like a bomb had gone off there. And that was the Ryan fire, and I took some pictures of it. I'm not sure. Uh, I think, uh, did you get some? Just a couple of them here. Oh. So that's what it looked like from uh, this part of the world. Uh, and it uh, only grew, and by the end of the day, it, had, it filled the sky like um, a huge cumulus cloud over the north, north horizon. It was quite remarkable. I think there's one other just... Uh, yeah, and that's what we're looking at as we climb the summit cone of Hans Peak, which is about 10,980 feet, almost 11,000. 11, okay, we can go back to the others. Uh, uh, again, I want to thank Kevin McBride and the Upper Yampa Water Conservancy Group. Thank you, Ken. Uh, and we look forward to having another opportunity to visit the site with more directors. Um, the next time we're up here, it could be a summer conference perhaps. Uh, but uh, Director Wells and uh, Director George and our finance um, chief, section chief, 
Kirk Russell uh, were able to visit the site. And um, I think it was very interesting, albeit I think we were going to, some of us are going to be rotating off. So we'd like to get more of our new directors on up there someday uh, over the next couple of years. The project will be uh, provide some resilience to, uh, to the uh, stagecoach reservoir and uh, allow it to continue to play a key role here in the Yampa Basin, being one of our few storage vessels here uh, in the basin. As elsewhere, everything is, all the rivers are running low. Uh, all our rivers are running about you know, 15 to 20 percent of the median uh, on the gauges. Uh, as uh, Director Ryan and uh, uh, Division Engineer uh, Aaron Light uh, described to you, uh, we did have a call in the first week of September on the entire Yampa River uh, from us, uh, and that was uh, instigated uh, from a senior irrigator in the Cross Mountain area west of Maybell. And the Cross Mountain area is just above Deer Lodge Park, which is the entrance of Dinosaur Na National Monument. And this is an aerial taken a few years ago. I think it was the flood 2011 when we had the flood. So you can see that uh, in a big year, um, the water comes into uh, some of the hammocks of, of cottonwoods uh, in the cottonwood bottoms there and provides an important uh, uh, signal uh, to the biological community there. But this is upstream of that. I just wanted to show you a few pictures um, that I took last Wednesday as I was heading down to Rangeley for our base roundtable meeting. And I took the opportunity to drop down into the bottom of uh, Deer Lodge Park there and look at it, look at the bottom, take a few pictures from the mouth of Cross Mountain Canyon, which is about 10 miles to the east, or seven miles to the east, uh, all the way down to this point here. So I'm gonna show you a few of those. So this is the uh, where the Yampa River exits Cross Mountain Canyon. As you can see, uh, there's a little berm to the left there, and I'm not sure if that was uh, bermed up for the pumper, that's a natural uh, channel in there, but that's the only flow we had coming out at that time. When I visited, it was 65 CFS. Um, the call was placed when it had dropped down to seven CF CFS on the, on the uh, dinosaur, uh, uh, on the Yampa gauge just above the entrance to Dinosaur National Monument. And that would have been eight miles downstream from here. Uh, there are three pumps in this section here, and they called it out on an 1886 water right. And that is very senior in our, in our valley here. So it gives you an idea of where we are in the pecking order. Uh, this is a shot upstream looking towards uh, Cross Mountain itself. Uh, this is where it's been uh, bermed up for the, for the uh, pumps. Uh, if you look, carefully see you see the uh, berm here and then to the right there is a, a, a pump uh, that you can see just off the shore there on the on the shore and then downstream uh, we're looking this is a 65 CFS flow coming through just east of the put in uh, for the river trips there and this is, I didn't walk all the way around to the gauging station, which is just around to the left, but this is what it looks like um, as it enters into the canyon uh, of the uh, Yampa. I think that's it. So I want to just remind, that's, so that picture was taken just about uh, at this point over here. Okay. I think that as we discussed yesterday, I think the first ever call on the river has had an educational benefit for our all our stakeholders, including our administrators uh, from the DWR. Uh, we've uh, been able to dust off our old augmentation plans and see if they 
work. I'm not sure how many were actually dragged off the shelf and put to work, but uh, it's definitely a wake up call for us. Uh, as I described yesterday, a uh, significant number of our head of our diversions and head gates do not have measuring devices on them. And I think is in order to protect people, their property right, which is the water right, uh, that owners, water right owners sh should be thinking about installing uh, water right uh, uh, diversion measuring devices in order to protect that right to use that water. Uh, round table, uh, oh, just another aside on water, uh, we actually, have, uh, we live a little bit, little bit above uh, Strawberry Park uh, in the Steamboat area, just north of Steamboat. And I've gotten a few calls from people down in the park itself who have some old hand dug red wells that are six to eight, six to 12 feet deep and are, one of them uh, has already run out of water for the first time in 60 years. Uh, so uh, it's pretty dry around here as <coughs> Director George observed. Uh, last week, uh, the roundtable met in Rangeley, and the Rio Blanco Water Conservancy District kindly gave us a tour of the dam site for their Wolf Creek Reservoir, and then uh, gave a full update on it at the roundtable uh, uh, for all the roundtable members, particularly those in the area who can't nor can not normally uh, meet our roundtable with our roundtable. Uh, the Rio Blanco submitted an application for a water plan uh, grant to complete the pre-permitting process uh, in which they, we have asked them to flesh out the purpose and need aspects of the project. Uh, they're also looking at uh, securing some stakeholder financing and setting up a lean permitting process uh, through this uh, grant. We'll be likely seeing this grant uh, as a water plan grant in November. Other news, uh, stream management. Oh, uh, another aspect of the <coughs> roundtable meeting is that Frank Kugel uh, from Gunnison uh, kindly took the time to come up to visit us to tell, tell us how uh, they have approached their planning process for the integrated water management plan. So. We got a lot out of that because there are some similarities between the Gunnison and uh, the Yampa uh, Basin. Uh, lastly, the stakeholders in the Yampa Water Fund uh, project are forming work groups to design the legal and governance structure of the Water Fund and to address technical and science issues. Uh, they're also trying to set up a communications and marketing plan. And I think, Mr. Chairman, that's the, my result report. All right. Thanks, Director Gallagher. Any questions for Director Gallagher? <coughs> Director Goebel. Thank Arkansas. you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Director Gallagher, for uh, hosting us here in Steamboat Springs. Um, wish I would have been able to make the tour on Monday, um, but it's a beautiful country, and I look forward to visiting again soon. <laughs> I'd also like to c congratulate Director Wells on her retirement and a very distinguished career in water. <clears throat> I wish you well in retirement. And also like to congratulate Director George on being award awarded the Governor's Citizenship Medal. Um, I feel very fortunate to get to serve with each of you. <coughs> Excuse me. The Arkansas Basin Roundtable met last week in Pueblo where Greg Johnson, Russ Sands, and Kara Sobieski from Wilson Water Group gave a presentation on the latest Swazi news and what to expect moving forward and um, answer a lot of questions from uh, folks at our round table um, on what to expect um, over the, the next few months and the next several years. So that was very helpful. Um, our officer elections will be held at our next meeting in October. Uh, Director Dutton, Kevin Hout, Chris Sturman, myself, and a bunch of uh, others uh, attended a tour of the Spring Creek burn scar in mid-August. Mid um, pretty devastating, but the 
tour gave us a clear picture of the severity of the fire and the magnitude of work left to do in recovery. Um, but it allowed for uh, some important connections to be made that will hopefully make the recovery process more efficient. Um, Kevin and Chris's past experience managing uh, disaster recovery funds has already proven helpful. Um, so um, we appreciate them making the trip down. Um, just a couple of slides <clears throat> on uh, hydrology in our basin. Uh, this uh, hydrograph is the, of the Arkansas River at Portland, which is measure, measured just upstream of Pueblo Reservoir um, as the river exits the mountains. And it's a, a commonly used gauge to, uh, um, to gauge river conditions. So this graph shows the last uh, five months. <clears throat> so you can see the, the red line shows this year's measurements and the dotted line is the 58 year average. Um, so runoff peaked about a month early and was about a thousand CFS below average. And uh, aside from that large spike, that rain event in uh, July has been well below average for the rest of the summer. <clears throat> Zooming in a, in a little bit on the last 50 days, um, at the same measurement station, you can see that we've been about 30 to 40 percent of uh, that 58 year average. So uh, and um, some of those releases um, are releases um, from reservoirs upstream. So the actual um, natural river flow would be much less than that. <clears throat> uh, Pueblo Reservoir, um, one of the, the reservoirs that uh, is still doing pretty well, a lot of municipal carryover storage. Um, it's currently storing 193,000 acre feet, which is about 90% of what it ha had this time last year. Like I said, it's in pretty good shape still, um, but we'll likely see it drop here in the last um, month or two of irrigation as the uh, as you saw the river conditions are, are pretty poor. So, um, and uh, irrigators are only allowed to carry over a certain portion of, of their uh, winter water storage. Um, and so that sh that'll probably tell off a little bit. <clears throat> Uh, the other major reservoir in the lower uh, part of the basin, John Martin Reservoir, is storing 140,000 acre feet, which is about 58% of what it had this time last year. And uh, I've shown there it's uh, dropped 173,000 acre feet um, since its high point this year in April, as irrigators uh, have made above average releases because of the hot and dry weather conditions. But very thankful for that storage. <clears throat> I showed a similar slide back in May that just showed uh, what a difference a year makes. And it's pretty dramatic. Um, this time last year, we were about 4% of the state was in drought and 35% uh, was abnormally dry. And now we're 83% abnormally dry and 72% in drought. So it's uh, pretty drastic. We've had a little bit of relief in the Southeast, um, uh, about <laughs> two weeks of rains um, in late July, early August, that, that helped us out, but uh, but still uh, suffering the effects of drought. And then one more uh, kind of similar slide um, that, that shows some photos of my boys here. So um, these were taken along our driveway about a year apart, and you can see just this the difference in grass. I mean, the, the one on the right looks like it should be January, and. Uh, and so this is them with their, their bucket calves they show at the county fair. And I think about the only thing that's the same is that my little boy's not wearing a shirt in either photo. So <laughs> <laughs> that's his summer attire and big old muck boots on with it. So anyway, that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Goble. Any questions for Director Goble? Director Gallagher. Did you get to show up at the fair? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He that one calf even drug him a little bit, but uh, but he straightened him out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> Moving on, Director Wells with the City and County of Denver. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I uh, too want to thank Director Gallagher and. Uh, Kevin McBride for the the tour that we took and I enjoyed meeting Lou. Um, Lou's ranch is kind of the site of the prospective 
uh, dam site and he has his house and buildings are up on a little rise and so the water would just kind of go all around his little island, soon to be a peninsula, <coughs> I guess. At any rate, it, uh, it was very interesting and I, I really enjoyed um, seeing some territory. Um, it's one of the uh, benefits of not working full time anymore is I can actually go on a tour every now and then. So that's great. Um, and uh, this year, as I've mentioned in the past, was in fact uh, Denver's, has, is Denver Water's 100th anniversary. And there have been a number of events. As Director Anderson said, I've been there for a lot of it, but not all of it. I keep reminding people, <laughs> you know, it's the 100th anniversary, but I wasn't here then. Um, but it has been really interesting. And I think I showed you a trailer for a film that was made by Jim Havey who the same production company that did The Great Divide, that film is really very well done. This one is called Written in Water. It was shown on Channel 20 in Denver, which is apparently an affiliate of Channel 9, last Sunday at 7 o'clock. Uh, if you have On Demand and Xfinity, you could probably pull it up by uh, saying Written in Water. It will be shown on PBS, but we don't have a firm date yet. When we do, I'll let you know. It's really very interesting because Denver Water is a pretty interesting place. Um, on to uh, current events. Uh, we have, uh, as you probably remember, got our 404 permit for enlargement of Gross Reservoir last summer. We keep expecting the f amendment to our FERC license any day now. Um, and... Uh, I, we don't really don't know what the holdup is. Uh, FERC did deny Gary Walkner's request, that's Save the Colorado, to intervene late, like at the end of everything, uh, maybe three months after the intervention period. Um, and uh, so we keep hoping for that. Um, however, two, three weeks ago, I guess, uh, a notice of intent was sent by a Washington law firm, DC law firm, to Fish and Wildlife Service saying that they were going to challenge the biological opinion for the green lineage cutthroat. Um, it's not clear whether green lineage cutthroat is the same as greenback cutthroat, uh, but nevertheless, it may be. So it is um, uh, at least a species of special concern. I, I can't remember exactly what it is. And uh, this law firm is, uh, this is what they do. This is their business, is challenging uh, environmental impact statements. So I'm kind of jealous. Northern got the student law center at DU, and we get um, the firm in DC that this is all they do for a living. Um, but uh, I think we, we should be okay. Uh, their claim is that the Fish and Wildlife Service and really CPW was heavily involved in this discussion of what should be done because uh, the, our diversion structures in the Fraser are all along the valley there and the fish ex exist above the diversion structures. And what the complaint said is usually it's all about entrainment and you need fish passage and all that sort of thing. In this particular case, if the fish go below the diversion structures, they will die because that's where all the non-natives are. The plan in this case is actually to keep the, the green lineage trout above the diversion structures and keep the non-natives below. So it's a little bit different and unusual, but the folks in DC who wrote that couldn't figure out couldn't figure that out. So we feel pretty good about that. Um, on the same day, uh, Save the Colorado sent a letter to the Corps saying, we think you should do a supplemental EIS. And um, the basis for their claim and the basis that will be their claim against FERC, uh, FERC was a cooperating agency with the Corps on the EIS, which was very helpful because FERC then could accept that EIS as their EIS and not have to start over. What FERC did do is an environmental assessment to look at changes really in mitigation in agreements that Denver Water had made since the final EIS was published. And that included an agreement with the Forest Service, 
for 4E conditions in the FERC permit and various and sundry agreements. And the uh, FERC found that all of those agreements, in fact, improved the environmental impact of the enlargement of Gross Reservoir and that it was a positive. That doesn't mean that Save the Colorado can't sue over it. So that's where we are. I think we're pretty, we'll be pretty uh, in good shape for a legal battle, but it is, you know, um, annoying that you have to go through it. Um, so that's going on and I'll let you know how, how, it, how we fare. Another uh, issue that I have uh, discussed in the past is the issue of whether Denver water will be compelled to put orthophosphate in its drinking water in order to coat uh, lead service lines to prevent lead from uh, being deposited from the service lines into the water. And this, these are service lines individually owned. Uh, not There is no lead in the water that uh, Denver Water provides, which is a typical situation. Um, we have been, uh, we have been working with the division. Uh, I think the division is also now starting a sort of stakeholders group. Uh, the problem with this uh, idea of putting orthophosphate in the water is, of course, it has phosphorus. And that phosphorus will end up in the environment through wastewater treatment plants, through lawn irrigation return flows. And because of the way the system works, it'll go above our system. Uh, to Chatfield Reservoir and Cherry Creek Reservoir, which have phosphorus control regulation. So it's a potential environmental problem. Uh, what we've been doing is more studies. What we, what we did for a study is you have, we harvested all these lead service lines and put them at each treatment plant. We have three. And then did flow through studies. And, and if you use this amount of pH, that's the other corrosion control measure. If you use pH, if you use orthophosphate, does lead precipitate out of these lines and get measured? And uh, the way the report was originally written is, on average, um, orthophosphate is two parts per billion better than pH. For context, the action level for lead in drinking water is 90th percentile, 15 parts per billion. Either one of the corrosion control treatments gets it down to seven or six, but one is a little higher than the other. But in more careful examination, orthophosphate um, has more variability. So if you're looking at lead releases, it goes up and down like this. It kind of settles down, but it's more variable than pH. And so the issue is, which is very interesting, and I think uh, the division starting to say that is interesting. Um, that actual that peak is actual lead in someone's tap, so that whether on average being two parts per billion better down here is really minimizing the lead when you've got these big peaks like you know fifty. So you want to try to so that's the that's the science that's going on, and um, I'm pretty hopeful that uh, we will be able to end up with pH and a, an aggressive lead service line replacement program. Obviously, the best thing to do is to get rid of all the service lines. But we have about 58,000, we think, lead service lines in our service area out of 300,000 service lines. And um, it costs maybe $4,000, $5,000 a line. So we're talking a couple hundred million dollars which no one has. Uh, but the idea is that um, in order to avoid the several hundred million dollars that wastewater treatment plants would have to spend to treat orthophosphate, that perhaps we could take some of that money and redirect it. So at any rate, all that's going on, and I'm hopeful that we will be able to come to a rational and um, conclusion that protects public health. So we are proceeding. Um, and then I want to do the Water Watch report. Thank you, um, Andrew. Uh, I don't know if you can <coughs> see it very well. The, on the top of the slide, the only thing that matters is the yellow line <clears throat> on the right-hand column. Our current storage for our whole system is 84%, and the historic median at this point in the year is 90%, which is pretty darn good. As you can see, we keep our reservoirs full <clears throat> to the extent we can. So, But it's not... It's not uh, bad, um, it's just 
lower than average. And then if you look at the, the um, uh, graph on the bottom, daily use, and I, I want to emphasize this one a little bit because it, this got misused recently in a letter that went to the board. So this is July, August, September. The blue line is the average use for that day from 2012 to 2017. And clearly there are a bunch of days that were over the average for those days. And that's because it's been 90 for a record number of days in you know history. It's been very, very hot. Uh, there are also days that are below that historic average because of course the historic average has days with all kinds of temperatures over, over six or seven years. And uh, the board got a letter from um, Trout Unlimited saying that, um, that the board should put our customers on mandatory restrictions because it's very warm, the water's very warm in the Fraser, and uh, therefore uh, the people of Denver uh, should use less water and that when people from the Fraser come to Denver, they see people watering their lawns at will and in relevant to this and people you you know your customers are using more water than normal well they are using more water than average they are not in fact using more water than normal the per capita use continues to go down and people are really not overwatering their grass very much anymore so these amounts that went over i just looked it up the city and county of denver alone gained 9000 800 people this year, from July 1st of last year to July 1st of this year. That's just the city and county of Denver. That doesn't, that's only half of our customers. So, you know, 10,000 more people in the city, and it was really, really hot. And, you know, so it, it's, they're not using more. It just happened to be really hot, which is the same thing that irrigators are doing in Arkansas. So, at any rate, it, uh, I'll show you in a minute that um, our customers can continue to respond to rain, uh, to cold weather, um, and they're so far really not overwatering. And people who are large users get individual attention from Denver Water. Um, do I need to do the next? So this is the reservoir supply contents. Um, we started out the year uh, above um, normal. And as you see that little red dotted line, was the prediction for a dry year. You can barely see the green and blue there um, up above. That was predictions for a normal or wet year. Clearly, we're having a dry year, but we did fill early, like everyone else, peaked early, uh, but we did fill. So we're in not in bad shape. Um, can you do the next one? You can skip that one. That's not very helpful. Okay, so this is, this is our... Uh, Denver Waters Watershed, South Platte on the top, Colorado on the bottom, cumulative preci precipitation. You know, we bumped along until we got to the summer and uh, spring. And uh, so snowpack was okay, but nothing much has happened since. One, and this is the chart that I show every time. Um, the dotted line, at the black dotted line at the top, is average temperature, and then the, the uh, orange is uh, actual temperature day by day. So, so you can see it's been, there have been some really hot days, not too many cold back in uh, March. Uh, <laughs> it was cold in March. Um, and then the blue line is water use. So uh, this shows a couple of things. People did not turn on their sprinklers until about the second week of April, and they were pretty good um, because it wasn't that hot. But as the temperature rises, so does, um, so does water use. The little green slivers on the bottom are precipitation events. And you can see when it rains, people quit watering. Uh, which is kind of amazing, um, actually. I don't know how they run out and you know turn off their <laughs> turn off their automatic controls. I'm not sure I could do it, um, but they do. They track the temperature and they track precipitation, and um, so they're they're doing pretty well. Uh, like everyone else, you know, it's going to depend what happens um, this uh, snow season. Um, uh, 
Director George, I, I don't know about the Farmer's Almanac uh, prediction. The people in uh, Denver who sell uh, ski equipment and four-wheel drive vehicles are advertising that, I've heard two of these, that there's an El Nino, I think, and that means it's going to be cold and snowy. And therefore, you need to buy your skis and your four-wheel drive vehicles now. So whether they're more up to date than the farmer's almanac, I don't know, but I can. We can only hope. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So you know. <laughs> yes, where, the, where, the, where all the skiing is, and then uh, just one more um, comment, sort of like commercial advertisement, I guess. Um, when Amy mentioned yesterday the impact of uh, the potential impact of the initiative on um, oil and gas um, spacing, um, the counter initiative that the oil and gas companies uh, paid to get on the ballot hasn't gotten as much attention. It's advertised as uh, greater protection for private property rights. What it says is to change the Constitution where it says private property shall not be taken or damaged for public use without just compensation. The sort of takings clause that's been there forever. It adds if property is, the value of property is affected by government regulation or law, I think. It's not limited to oil and gas or mineral estates. It's limited to any kind of property. And um, so uh, the Colorado Municipal League and Colorado counties and the state um, are justifiably concerned. There's constraints on what governments can do. But this could include a zoning issue that cites a group home in your neighborhood. Or it could be a government that says, you only get 50% of the water you need because then your value of your crop goes down. So therefore I can sue the district who told me I only get a 60% allotment. It's everything that government does. And in the eye of somebody, um, it affects their property values. And uh, you let too many people move in and I have a multifamily house next to me and that lowered my property, whatever it is. So that's how it's written. It's like four words. And uh, just so you'll know, um, there, there are some things that, that uh, entities can do to let their customers know what the impact might be. It's much worse for general purpose governments than it is for those of us who deal only in water. But even at, even at that, we, we do regulate. So at um, any rate, just wanted to point that out. It's not getting a lot of attention yet because it doesn't have, um, you know, the, the money is not in the hands of those who would be affected. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Wells. Wells, any questions for Director Wells? All right, we'll proceed. Director Dutton, the Rio Grande. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Director Gallagher, for having us here. And thank you for the lovely book. I will treasure it. I'm really excited to read it. Um, you know, oh, my goodness. Thanks. OK. I just use Andrew. <laughs> He's more effective than me being in charge. <laughs> Let's stick, stick with the Aspen. It works. Oh my goodness. Tractors, Aspen. What do we. It works. Um, Director Wells, I'm on board with the advertisement in Denver because I bought some snowmobile gear yesterday. So, <laughs> so just let's all believe. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging that Wayne Schwab is in the audience. He came all the way up here for an agenda item today, but he was telling me yesterday he really enjoys these meetings and, and has been here. So um, if you guys need a perspective on everything we've learned the last couple of days, check in with Wayne because he he's like a sponge absorbing everything. So thanks for being here, Wayne. <laughs> uh, I want to acknowledge too that, you know, the staff continues to really be involved in our basin and helping out with a lot of great things. And Megan continues to come to every single roundtable meeting and she come to, comes to our executive committee meetings and is available for people to ask questions. And we just appreciate the heck out of Megan. She's, she's phenomenal. Um, Russ and Alex actually joined Megan as well at our last roundtable meeting. We had a, a Swazi technical meeting in the morning talking about the 
um, agriculture monitoring. And so it was really great to have you guys there too. So thank you. Our roundtable is working with the Southwest Roundtable and the Arkansas Roundtable on a South Slope meeting. And so it looks like that's hopefully going to be either the end of October or the beginning of November. I think we were feeling left out of all the other big roundtable summits and wanted to get in on something with our neighbors. So <laughs> I, it looked like there are the themes that people are interested in discussing are watershed health and forest management, especially with a, a lens towards fire, since, since all three basins ex experienced some pretty big fires this year. There was a big interest in talking about preserving agriculture and um, a huge interest in learning from each other and having a forum on how people have done projects, how people's roundtables function, but just what what have been successes and failures and how can we learn from each other. And so I'm looking forward to that very much. And I'm sure anybody who wants to attend will be welcome. We are very friendly. It's going to be an Alamosa. We're already talking about having door prizes that would probably be potatoes. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> but who doesn't love potatoes? So uh, we've also been s continuing our series of roundtable education tours. So there was a, a tour that mimicked the Water Education Colorado tour because many of our roundtable members weren't able to get on the WECO tour. So we did it again for our own people and, and it was a huge, huge showing of people. We had all kinds of pickups and cars and I think there were 20 or 30 people that spent the day going back up to Platoro and talking about everything. And so it was really neat just to see how within the basin, we all want to learn from each other as well. And we're, we're heading on the road next week. We'll, we'll be going up to Denver and we'll be touring the wise project. And then other, um, other as my understanding is Denver water is going to be our host. So it's pretty exciting. Could be, <laughs> I don't set up the tours, so. <laughs> but we're all looking forward to it. And, um, understanding that our municipalities are so much smaller, but we're excited to see to see the project and to learn from it. Our education committee is also working really hard on a new website. And with that, we have a, a cute new logo, but it's not ready for prime time. So you guys can see that in November. Um, so now we're gonna get into some pictures. This is a, above Creed. It's looking gorgeous. Last time in, in our last meeting in Glenwood, I showed pictures of, of the growing season and now it is harvest, which is exciting. And so um, most of the hay guys are, are on their third cutting of alfalfa and then people that just you know grow pasture hay on the rivers and stuff are, are pretty much done picking up their hay. Potato harvest is, is in peak right now. And so this is a pretty typical operation. Um, this farm runs they have two diggers out front. So those, those two tractors out front are called, um, they're pulling digger windrowers. And so each of those machines is picking up six rows of potatoes. And so um, in the foreground of the picture, you can see the dirt that's all soft and fluffy and doesn't have any, any uniform vines left on it. So then moving over past that tractor track, the, those digger windrowers are picking up six rows each and they're piling them into the middle. They're both, they're both py piling different directions so the windrows have left, those diggers have left those piles. And then this is the harvester coming along. He picks up the 12 rows that the diggers dug and he digs his own four rows. So picking up 16 rows at a time. Each pass through the field is about 2.64 acres. And they end up harvesting about 130,000 pounds of potatoes with each trip through the field. So it's great fun. <laughs> Um, I showed a picture of the quinoa last time, and so this is it now. It's it's all cured out, cured, excuse me, cured out and ready to go. And so uh, this crop was a mix of black, white, and brown quinoa, and it's kind of hard to separate it all out. So it'll just be a very colorful, beautiful mix. Some people are harvesting their quinoa now. Um, this this is my dad's crop, and they decided to plant theirs late so that they can harvest it after potatoes to have one less thing to be stressed about. So so this stuff is going to hang out and cure. For a couple more weeks and then they'll be picking it up and quinoa is i think it's a really exciting crop for us because this crop this year took it they haven't got the final numbers yet but between eight and ten inches of water which the potatoes on the previous slide took about 22 inches of water so if we could figure out the market for colorado quinoa this could be a huge help for our basin and probably for the arkansas as well so yeah if, if you guys need quinoa recipes see me after <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, I, I wanted to echo Director Goebel's sentiments that uh, staff came down and attended a tour where we, we started on our side of the hill and then went over to the other side and, and looked at some of the areas that were affected by the spring fire. And I think there's still, you know, with any, any disaster like this, there's still the um, planning stage and kind of the analysis st stage and looking at if we are gonna do things, where would it be a good use of money and where would it be effective in protecting life and safety and natural resources. And so the groups are all working on their plans. I imagine there will probably be some, I know there's a water plan grant that came in, but I imagine there will probably be some additional requests for funds. But right now, um, they're hoping to get some EWP money. And so Chris especially has been really helpful in visiting with the folks in Custia County about how to manage EWP funds and how to take care of a, a huge project like this, which this, this will be in no means the same scale of the EWP project Chris and Kevin just finished managing. So their expertise is, is really valued and we're very appreciative. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about flows. We, I don't, I think we're all tired of belaboring it, but the flows have been pretty dismal. This is below Rio Grande Reservoir, which <clears throat> passes all inflows during the summer months. And as you can see, the river was, was really low and um, pretty sad at that point, but it's still there. And, and as far as I know, the fish are still kicking. So fingers crossed that we can make it through this. Um, this is a, a, this shows the record for the Rio Grande at Del Norte. And Cleve Simpson, who manages the Rio Grande Water Conservation District, presented this graph at Water Congress. And I wanted to share it too, because Cleve made a pretty interesting observation that we are entering the first, or we're getting ready to complete the first time where we've had an entire decade where flows at the Del Norte gauge did not hit 700,000 acre feet. And we are entering the first time in 20 years where flows did not hit 800,000 acre feet. And so it's pretty sobering and we are all, I think, wrapping our heads around the fact that we, we will likely be seeing fewer, um, fewer uh, probably more variations, but then fewer of those big years in the long run. And that was a huge conversation during our Swazi modeling conversation of, of recognizing that we need to be planning for this continued downward trend. Uh, these are the flows, the projected flows this year from our 10 day report from September 5th, which Craig Cotton, our division engineer puts out. And so average flows on the Rio Grande are 643,000 acre feet. Again, that's at the Del Norte gauge. Craig is projecting that we will see 285,000 acre feet this year. And of that 72,000 acre feet, so 20% of the index flows needs to make it to New Mexico. Uh, because because it's such a, a low obligation, we'll be able to make up that during the shoulder season. So the curtailment has been zero. It doesn't mean we're drying up the river. There were still about 12 feet crossing the state line this morning, which uh, is pretty sad. But um, irrigators aren't being curtailed, and it's not. It's just because there's not a lot of water there. The Canaas is in a similar boat. Their average is 324,000 acre feet. The projection for this year is 160,000. Of that, they need to send 25,000 down. So they also have a 0% curtailment. But I'm pretty sure the only the top priority has been in for all summer long. So um, if, you have, if you've got a number two or number three water ride on the Canales, you are not getting water this year. Oh, it stopped working. That's sad. <laughs> <Time's up. laughs> I guess, yeah, cowbell. Um, so those those sobering. I sorry, I feel like I really sucked the air out of the room on that one. It's. Um, I'll put it back in, and guys, I promise one more sad graph. So, um, this is the change in storage in the unconfined aquifer. This is only in 2002, so it's kind of the or since 2002. So this is the zoomed in version. But the I realize I can't. Well, Jim probably can because he's got better eagle eyes. But I can't read the bottom. Um, but the bottom is the years. The point here is that 2013 was the lowest year. That's that bottom, and then. Ever since then, and with the with Subdistrict One working really hard, we've been seeing gains in the aquifer. But you can see on the far right, just this year, we lost all the gains we've made since 2015. 
So the impact of, of low surface flows to bring water in to recharge the aquifer coupled with you know, higher temperatures and, and more crop needs has led to a huge amount of pumping and a huge amount of reliance on groundwater this year, which means we're gonna have to work really hard to meet the sustainability requirements by, um, by the rules that were imposed by the statute for the subdistrict. So hopefully we can all rally and come up with some creative ideas. Okay, so I wanted to um, add a little, a little bit of happiness in here. So it, <laughs> in the face, even in the face of, of some sad flows and um, difficult times, we are still implementing good projects. And so if this looks like a Forest Service employee <clears throat> strapping explosives to a tree, it is. <laughs> and you may recall in March that we approved a WSRF grant from the Rio Grande Basin account to blast trees around two lakes that are in the wilderness. So Spruce Lakes are owned by some families in between Del Norte and South Fork that uh, they're, they're some of those fifth and sixth generation families who have been ranching along the Rio Grande for a long time. And they have water rights in Spruce Lakes, which are really important to their operations. Uh, since Spruce Lakes is in the wilderness and it's surrounded by beetle killed trees, they've been seeing a lot of dead, down and dead trees falling in the lakes and then floating down into the spillway. Um, the dam safety engineer had said if they could not get a handle on those dead trees, they would have to breach the dams. And so not only was that a concern for the irrigators, but the <laughs> Spruce Lakes are full of Rio Grande cutthroats. It's a thriving conservation population. And so Trout Unlimited got involved and wrote a, a roundtable grant to get rid of the trees. The Forest Service worked with the, worked with the project team and they determined that it would be safer, cheaper, and faster to blast the trees than to try to take crosscut saws in there and do the same thing. And so over four days, a crew of 15 people that rotated in and out, so I was only there for a couple of days, but a crew was able to take down 500 trees, get them away from the lake and, and protect the water resources. So this next slide shows uh, what it looked like after we tied bundles of explosives to trees and then ran the deck cord around. Um, it was pretty exciting. I was there 30 minutes and, and I was and already trained to hang explosives to trees. So it was, it was a really good deal. So, so now we have a video. <laughs> Turn up the sound. <laughs> 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 that was so fun. <laughs> So that was one of about 20 blasts that occurred over the four days. No, that was the that was the PG video. Oh, was it? <laughs> it it kind of sucks the air out of you. So I sent some videos to Director Yon where there's cursing. <laughs> That's my report. <laughs> Thank you, Director Dutt. Yeah, she said every time that they uh, they hit the explosion that it was the same reaction. <laughs> Took your breath away and then somebody cursed. And then we all giggled. <laughs> <laughs> looked exciting. Uh, any, direct, any questions for Director Dutt? All right, thank you. Uh, I'm questioning my idea to switch with you, Director Gallagher, now that it's kind of hard to follow explosion of trees. <laughs> so I'll give my report now. Um, I want to thank the Director Gallagher and the Yampa area for hosting us. I always enjoy coming to Steamboat. Uh, and uh, we took, a, I wasn't able to go on the tour, but, but when the roundtable uh, started in the South Platte Basin Roundtable in 2005, we came to the Yampa in 2006, maybe. Our chairman, uh, Bill Jerky and Tom Eisenman, who was with the Nature Conservancy then, he was in our environmental rep. We came to the Yampa and we were given a tour by John Fetcher. So John Fetcher sat in my pickup and gave me a tour of Stagecoach and Yamcola, and then we brought him back, uh, and then we went down to Maybell and looked at some other things. So it was a great tour, but I, I'm sorry I missed the one on Monday. 
Monday, was it? Yeah, Monday. Right. So, yeah, I'd like to see it again. <laughs> I also uh, went on a bike ride after Tuesday's fi finance committee meeting, and my wife is here with me, and uh, Director Dutton, Lauren Riss, and Jonathan Hernandez. Uh, we all went up the hill and just coasted down. And so that was that was good start. But my wife and I were at the end. So these three took off and my wife and I, I was just behind my wife to make sure that she got down. But she yelled out, don't they know we're planes people? <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> so anyway, we made it down without any problems. Um, on our round table news, uh, we had our last roundtable meeting uh, last week in Holyoke, which we try to go out to a few places outside of our normal Longmont uh, meeting area. So we went to Holyoke uh, and it was hosted by our Republican River Water Conservancy District member, um, Deb Daniels. So we, she enjoyed having us out there. Not a lot of, not as many people showed up to Holyoke as they do in Longmont, but we had a good, good, Good crowd, and uh, Holyoke, by the way, is still an hour and 15 minutes away from where I live. So everybody thought, well, it's out east. Jim doesn't have to travel, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I do. Um, so, um, but in the, uh, in the round table, we, it was fairly short. Uh, we talked about, uh, continued to talk about the high groundwater areas on the South Platte. And uh, as part of that though, before the round table, um, a couple weeks at least, Eric Skye from CWCB took us out to the Walker Recharge Project, which we're going to hear some uh, some loan requests today, and that's a great project, a big project from the Central Colorado Water Conservancy District. So we got to visit that along with a dewatering project in the Fort Morgan area from the Highway 144 Ranchettes, which is working well in that area too. So Eric oversaw that um, that uh, project <laughs> on the Highway 44 Ranchette. So it's working well. And also the dewatering well that's in Gilcrest is working well for the town of Gilcrest right now. So so th that's good news. There's still other things to be done in the area, of course, but it was a good update. We also got an update from our um, education action uh, plan and other things. And one of the things we were looking at is updating our website and making it more user-friendly. Um, so that was good to hear from our education committee. They're doing quite a lot of things trying to get the word out and we hope someday to have a video. I know everybody gets to show their video of their basin, but the South Platte's never had one. So we're going to see if we can get one to show too, because I feel left out. Um, uh, another discussion we had was of course on the IBCC funding committee and we had a lot a lot of input from our people on the round table so our IBCC committee should be fun and interesting because we we have a few concerns with that um, and one of the major cons well a, a couple of the concerns are the IBCC funding from the perspective of our round table is being driven by the Gates Foundation's meeting so we kind of feel like we're left behind just a little bit on that. And so we want to make sure that, that our input is, is put into that funding piece. Um, and one of the things that's, that was a little bit troubling is that the idea that someone other than the CWCB would be in charge of distributing any funding that we get. And that was a bit troubling because we are we have an excellent staff, we have a board set up, we're used to doing things like that. And as you saw yesterday, when we're when our entity is faced with uh, new <clears throat> funding um, requests or new funding programs, they step up, we might have to add staff or something like that, but there's no doubt that uh, our staff can do it and do it well. So um, I, I was interested in, Director Anderson, you said, you know, where, the people upstream when they become more efficient, this is on a different note, but when Anna, people upstream become more efficient, then you see a little bit more water in the river. It's the opposite in our area. <laughs> when we become more efficient, the people downstream see less water because uh, we are 
uh, able to irrigate more fully our 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 area. Like our our district, for interest, for instance, is forty thousand nine hundred sixteen point nine four acres. Um, we irrigate about thirty five thousand of that, but with uh, but we are able to do um, it more, or it's better for us because we're more efficient. We can grow more yield on our acreage but the people downstream see a little bit less water because there's less runoff and less deep perk from our area. So less return flows downstream. So it's kind of interesting and it just goes to show you that different basins act differently to the same uh, mechanisms. So I just thought that was interesting. Um, the other, one of the other things is we're thankful to all of you. We know we've been working on this Sprog project and yesterday you did a W, approved a WSRF uh, request for the South Platte Regional Water Development Concept Pre-Feasibility Study. And we appreciate that very much because we think that's uh, an important thing to continue moving forward. And we're excited to do so. Um, I have a few slides and I just want to put this one up because this is uh, yesterday. This is the Henderson gauge, which is just right outside of Denver. And you can see they got rain in Denver yesterday. See that peak? <laughs> about midnight at Henderson of 1200, 1300 CFS. And the reason I'm excited about that is because it's going to come down to me. And I think because we're getting some rain this morning, we had some rain. I have to make my calls to the, uh, to the ditch riders and the reservoir operators in the mornings at six. So when I made the calls, they all said it was raining. So out in our area too. So that's going to diminish the demand. And I'm hoping our 1915 direct flow right is going to be in priority with this little flush and that rain. So maybe in a few days we'll get some water because some of our farmers, I've mandatorily curtailed them because they're out of water in our reservoir. And so anyway, we, we're looking uh, forward to having some of that direct flow that would come down to us. Um, let's see if this works. Oh, okay. I know why it works. Because So I just wanted to show you a few pictures. Um, I'm not a very good photographer, but <laughs> show you a few <laughs> pictures. And this actually is in uh, the general manager of Northern Brad Wynn's area. And this is uh, the results of a July 29th uh, hailstorm and tornado oh, action wow. in the Hill Rose and Brush area. And I believe... Brad was in his tractor at the time and had to hide underneath. Is that correct? Wow. Yeah. So it wasn't, uh, it was pretty exciting for him to say the least. So this is <laughs> at the Hill Rose Exchange. You can see a light pole down and power pole. There were over 200 power poles that went down due to this. Um, we have a, a guy that works at the North Sterling Reservoir State Park and his uh, Ant was driving across this area and it just came up on them so fast that they had to completely stop. They were hoping to exit at this exit and get underneath, but they couldn't get off the exit. It was so bad. And it broke out the windows of their minivan and bruised them from the hailstones. So it was a pretty rough, rough night out on the plains. If you want to go to the next one, it doesn't seem. So this is another picture of a grain bin that was damaged from the wind and do you see on the fence there, the holes in the fence are from hailstones <coughs> hitting the fence and putting holes what? in it. So next, we just have several. So this is a fully, almost fully grown cornfield that doesn't look so good anymore. That's the results of the hail. Um, this one's a little harder to see, but you can see the corn is almost laying down because of the winds. Uh, not only the hail knocked it down, but the winds laid it over as well. And this is uh, across the river. This is near where Brad was hiding under his tractor. <laughs> and this is, you, if you look down in the river bottom, I have another picture, but if you look down the river bottom, the trees for about a mile section were defoliated. It looked like winter down in the river bottom. So, and you can see the cornfield. This is irrigated by gated pipe. And here's some power poles that are down in the tree damage over there. Next one. There's some trees that were completely defoliated. Um, center pivot that was, there were several of these. I mean, uh, I don't know exactly how many, but 
many, many center pivots were turned over. And then some building damage, of course, too. By tornadoes? What's that? It was tornadoes? Tornadoes, wow. yep. I think how much, there were four tornadoes, I believe. Three tornadoes in the Hill Rose and Brush area. And this, this is the fourth hailstorm storm this area some of this area received this summer. So the first one was June 18th, and the, they are not just your mild hail storms, but they were pretty uh, pretty severe. And this was, of course, one of the most severe. Some people had replanted, and this one mowed off their replant. So it was a rough year for some of them. And this is, uh, I, I always tell you, I do the pictures from the porch. Well, this is someone else's porch, but uh, <laughs> I performed a wedding. Uh, at the in, in August here, or no, is at first of September, and this was at the Bayside Golf Course near Lake McConaughey. It was a very <coughs> beautiful area and a nice wedding, and I performed the wedding for my sister's nephew and my daughter's uh, my daughter's boyfriend's sister. So um, <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> or just. Perpetuating the idea that we're all related in small town. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that will end my report. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll take a 10 minute break. Be back. That was great. Check us out. We're on time. Almost. Almost. Five minutes. Five minutes.
continue on with our meeting agenda item 19 northern colorado water conservancy district dedication of the mitigation releases for in-stream flow use in the cash Lafuda river all right kaylee good morning good morning there we go good morning kaylee white cwcb staff so this is the second look at the uh, Northern Water Dedication um, of releases for the cash Laputer. So today with the board, the staff is gonna recommend action by the board. One second. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so um, much of this presentation is a bit of a repeat from last time because we were presenting it last time and you needed to know all the factors then. You need to know all the factors again today to make the decision. Uh, so you will see some things that you saw in um, July. Uh, but the background here is a reminder is uh, Northern Colorado Water Conser Conservancy District acting through their Northern Integrated Supply Project Water Activity Enterprise. We will call NISP or Northern today. Um, so they're pursuing their project to provide another 40,000 acre feet of new reliable water supplies to its 15 members uh, on the East Slope. And they've committed to these uh, reservoir releases as part of their mitigation plan. So they went to um, the legislature to actually get this done, spent a couple of years there and got their statute passed earlier this year. Uh, so we are acting under, um, under that particular statute, Senate Bill 18170. So they've come to CWCB under that statute, which is required um, to offer a contractual interest uh, for dedicated water for in-stream flow uses on the cash flow pooter through a certain reach, a certain identified reach on the cash flow pooter. So it's a potential long-term lease of up to 14,350 acre feet. And it's to be released or to be delivered at a rate of 18 to 25 CFS. So from last board meeting to this board meeting, there's a little clarification that that requirement, the 18 to 25 CFS needs to be available to the members at the downstream point. So there may be some transit losses that are assessed. And so some the releases from Glade Reservoir may need to be a little bit higher. And there's no direct cost to CWCB, although we will be co-applicants in water court. So here's the reach, comes from the new site of Glade Reservoir at the mouth of the canyon on the Cache Laputer, down and into the, around the city of Fort Collins, around Mulberry Street. And I think Jay is gonna try to uh, focus this map for you a little better. It's also in your board packet. I'll keep going forward. So uh, the in-stream flow rule six process for an acquisition of an in-stream flow. So what we're using here, and it requires a minimum of two meeting process in front of the board, um, opportunity for the public to comment and request a hearing if, if um, desired within 20 days of the last meeting, no hearing was requested. So the board can take action at this board meeting. So the staff provided Notice is required to the um, in-stream flow mailing list, to um, the SWSP mailing list for Division One. We requested recommendations from uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, from BLM, and from the Forest Service. So we have a Parks and Wildlife recommendation letter that's attached to your uh, documents. And that was written by Jay Skinner and Katie Birch, who are both here to answer any questions you have for Parks and Wildlife. 
And we also got a letter of support from Trot Unlimited, which I hope has been added to your uh, board packet. It came in just a few days after we um, published the memo. So if you don't have that, let me know and I'll provide a copy. So the water proposed for dedication is again up to 14,350 acre feet to be stored in Glade Reservoir. The protected mitigation releases are pursuant to uh, Senate Bill 18170, not 107, that's where that was. Um, I knew there was a typo somewhere in the documents, there it is. Okay, so, uh, but the statute is 3792-1028 is where it's codified. Uh, the project is guided by the, um, the mitigation and enhancement plan. And there's an IGA with um, CPW, with Parks and Wildlife. So the water would be used to preserve and improve the natural environment on the Cache Laputer from Glade Reservoir. Um, near the mouth through the city of Fort Collins. It's approximately 11 miles. I know there was two different downstream points that we were talking about. There was 11 miles or 13 miles. I think we're at 11 and a half now. So the releases or the deliveries will be made um, up to 18 to 25 CFS year round. And there is a schedule of releases uh, monthly. So it would be a constant. Uh, and then the flow rate that was recommended by Parks and Wildlife has also been adjusted since our last board meeting. Um, they took another look at the R2 cross data and other, um, uh, I guess, field work that they have done and modeling on the cash Laputer for this reach in particular. And so the flow rate recommendations by Parks and Wildlife increased a little bit. It was, uh, in the winter, it was 55 to preserve and it's gone up to 80. Um, so now our range to improve in the winter is 80 CFS to 100 CFS. And in the summer, it's from 114 CFS up to that rate to preserve the natural environment and from 114 up to 260 CFS in the summer in this particular reach. So this is a Dirish fishery. It's, we've got both native and non-native species. We're up in the cold water territory here in these reaches. Um, as the slope decreases, you transition more into the warm water, um, but that's below the reach that's at question today. So the method of this acquisition is that we have, we will negotiate or we have pretty much negotiated the terms of a, of a lease agreement. And so you have the semifinal form in your board documents. And what we will ask today is to authorize our director to go ahead and sign a lease that's substantially similar to what you have in your in your packet. And then after all that's done, we will be going to court with Northern uh, to water court as co-applicants. Um, let's see, and that's required by um, section 1028. Uh, the operation, reporting, administration, all that that happens once you get a water right in place, um, that'll be directed by our uh, the dedication agreement, the terms in the court case, the statute. Um, I think Northern's going to do a lot of that with consultation with CWCB, but they're taking on the main uh, responsibility of, of operations. So some of our rule six factors that the board um, needs to consider before it accepts a donation is... Um, usually if we do a change of water rights, some of the factors are that you have to consider the historical use, maintenance of return flows, um, and even uh, material injury to existing junior water rates if you're changing a senior water right. None of that's particularly at issue here because this is a new, new storage right, new water in the river. Uh, it will promote maximum utilization. It'll be used for uh, in-stream flow uses to preserve and improve the natural environment in the cash Laputer, and then it'll also be used by their participants for um, the more traditional consumptive uses downstream. And we have confirmed with our compacts group that it does not negatively impact any interstate compact. 
So for stacking, if we put water in this river um, under an acquisition, if we had an existing in-stream flow appropriation, we could use them both in the river, an additive. Um, we don't have an existing appropriated in-stream flow, but if we put more acquired water rate in this reach of the river, then we would, we would use both of those water rates together so you could add them together or however many we end up putting in the river to help this particular reach of stream, which is um, dries up at points. So we did discuss the administrability of this case um, as required with division one engineer. And he confirmed that with appropriate decree terms that he could administer, um, the division engineer um, would like to work with CWCB in Northern just to make sure that the the terms that are necessary in the decree are there so that he can administer it. So our recommendation, and this is the same uh, as in your board packet. It seems long, but there's, there's five things here. So one is to conclude that the use of the water under the proposed acquisition by this dedication agreement of the protected mitigation releases, which is a defined term in the statute, is appropriate to preserve and improve the natural environment of the Cache Laputer within the, quote, qualifying stream reach, which is also a defined term in statute, to a reasonable degree. A second request or recommendation is to determine that the acquired protection, uh, the mitigation releases would be best utilized by protecting the water through the qualifying stream reach up to the recommended winter and summer preserve and improve flow rates from CPW that are in the document that I just presented those, those a little bit higher numbers. So we want to put in 18 CFS um, up to whatever the, the number was for that particular season up to the 80 or up to the 150 CFS. Uh, the third thing we'd like you guys to um, to do is accept the dedication from Northern uh, to authorize the director to execute the dedication agreement in a form substantially similar to the one in your packet. And finally, to direct staff to work with the Attorney General's office to and Northern to file that water court application in accordance with the statute. All right. Any thanks. questions? Oh, and. We have representatives from Northern here, uh, Peggy Montano and Davis Wirt, Northern's attorneys, and Jerry Gibbons, operations manager, are here. And from CPW, we have Jay Skinner and Katie Birch. And then I've also been working on this project in-house with Linda Bassey and our attorney, Jen Neely, all of whom are in the audience, if you have questions for <laughs> any of them or for me. Would any of you Northern people like to speak, say something? We didn't bite you up. Welcome, Jerry. Just state your name and who you're with. Thank you, Chairman Yon. Uh, my name is Jerry Gibbons. I'm Director of Oper Operations at Northern Water. Uh, again, we'd like to, to thank uh, the board and the staff for uh, consideration of this matter uh, through the uh, legislation that went through uh, uh, the legislature earlier this year and last year, um, as well as all the work that's gone on by both CPW and CB. CWCB staff uh, over the last three or four years to develop this mitigation plan. It's an important uh, plan for the NIST project and NISP is a very important project for uh, Northeastern Colorado. And so we appreciate your time and consideration of the matter. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have. All right. Thanks for being here, all you Northern people. Um, you. Any questions? Director Wells. I, I don't actually have a question, um, but I, I wanted to uh, compliment all of you who've worked on this for the last three or four years. It took two tries at the legislature to uh, make sure that this uh, program would work. And um, I keep sending the details out to folks at Denver Water and elsewhere, because if you can use a river instead of a pipe to deliver some water, then you can probably do a lot of good uh, for the environment. So being able to release water from storage and have it get to its recipients and, and improve the river in, the, in, inter, in between is a great thing. Um, 
If there aren't questions, I would move approval of the staff's recommendation on item agenda item 19. It's been moved by Director Wells, seconded by Director Hawkins. I actually have a question, sorry. Oh, yeah, to uh, approve agenda item 19. Is there any other discussion? Director Trick. Um, yeah, I have a question for uh, Linda or Kaylee. Um, I'm not sure which one of you can address. Um, so the mitigation release amounts of 18 to 25 CFS, uh, is that correct? That's what's required in the mitigation plan um, is my understanding. And my question is, so the uh, contract, the draft contract that's in our board packet, I think it's um, section L. Can you address the reason why the mitigation release amounts are different than the amounts in L1 of the contract? So I guess what I'm getting at is the, the 18 to 25 CFS is what's required for mitigation releases, but the recommendation or the, the agreement states that winter flows up to 55 CFS to 85 oh. CFS are agreed upon for the agreement. So sure. I guess, can you, can you uh, address yes, that? Yes, that is because we have not updated the lease since we changed the numbers. Okay. So yes, good point. And that will be something that we will be updating with, with the new flow recommendation numbers by CPW, which came in, uh, you know, within the last month or so. So we're um, working on updating all the, all the documents. So that will definitely be updated, but also the, just to clarify that the release numbers are not necessarily a release from the reservoir, but a delivery down to the, to the members downstream. So if you add some transit loss, the actual releases may be a little bit higher. So okay. those two things will need to be correct, need to be updated in the draft lease. So I guess my, my second part of the question is, so the amount that actually is going to be dedicated to the board or for the board's, I guess, dominion and control is only the amount of the required mitigation release. Okay. So the 18 yes. to 25. Okay. Yes. And my, so part of that, part of the question of that was, was whether or not the board was planning on filing an industry flow right for what amounts I thought were exceeding that, but that's probably a no to that answer to that question. Um, the answer to that is no. Um, the, these are the, we, we are going to, to obtain a decreed right to protect the mitigation, the protected mitigation releases. That sounds redundant. Um, under the decree where we, wherein we're a co-applicant with Northern. And um, these are the, the flow rates the mitigation releases will be an incremental approach to meeting the preserve and improve flow rates that CPW has recommended. And I wanted to clarify, I heard your question is asking whether the flow rates in this section L should be 18 and 25. And I wanted to clarify that here we are um, outlining the recommended preserve and improve flow rates in this recital, okay. not the um, mitigation release rates. Not the actual dedication amount. Correct. Okay. Thanks. I had a similar question, Linda. So Northern doesn't have to deliver this water if the river's high. So do, is that correct? I don't believe it is. And Northern may be best equipped to answer that question. My understanding is that Northern's going to make those mitigation releases regardless of flows in the river. Um, that's correct. Northern's all around. <laughs> <laughs> so even during a flood stage or something like that, you would still put it. Yes, the the agreement was by and large. Um, my name is Jerry Gibbons, Director of Operations of Northern Water. For the record, um, our agreement uh, in the mitigation plan is to release that eighteen to twenty five CFS uh, pretty much every day of the year. There's a couple of exceptions. One is if there were flood conditions that prevented us from making that release, 
or water quality conditions where the quality of that water was not sufficient for our participants to treat that uh, given their uh, treatment systems. But uh, by and large, um, you know, 350 days of the year, we're gonna be making that release. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, we have a motion on the table. And uh, so there is no more discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Kaylee, thank you. Northern. Continue on to agenda item 20, Abrams Creek and stream flow appropriation. Rob. Good morning. For the record, Rob Veal, CWCB staff. I am presenting agenda item 20, final action on the contested 2018 in-stream flow appropriation on Abrams Creek. So just to give you a little bit of geographic orientation, uh, Abrams Creek is located in Division 5 <clears throat> in uh, Eagle County, about seven miles south um, southeast of the city of Eagle, as you can see on this map here. Um, the CWCB already holds an existing in-stream flow water right uh, on Abrams Creek in case number 80 CW118, and this is for a year-round flow rate of 0.5 CFS. The current recommendation from the Bureau of uh, Land Management is an increase requesting 0 0.75 CFS May, CFS May 1st through September 30th, and that goes from the headwaters down to the Mrs. Pay Ditch. Um, fishery surveys conducted revealed a self-sustaining population of native cutthroat trout. The Abrams Creek population is considered a core conservation population of pure green lineage, Colorado River cutthroat trout, and consistent with Colorado's uh, cutthroat trout conservation strategy, the goal of this ISF recommendation is to protect and increase the resiliency of the fish population, specifically protecting ISF flows on Abrams Creek will assist with maintaining and protecting physical wetted habitat along approximately four miles of stream, uh, improve st in-stream habitat con connectivity, pool depths, and cooler water temperatures. So here's a map showing the proposed reach. <coughs> and as you can see on this map, there's one diversion on the reach, and it is the JPO number two ditch, which is owned and operated by the Buckhorn Valley Metropolitan District Number One, as you can see here on the map too. I'm going to try something risky. Um, this blue line is where this ditch comes up and goes out this way, and I'll show another slide that will better describe it. So, with this very important fish population in mind, um, the CWCB approved grants of $549,000 from the Fish and Wildlife Resources Fund and $364,711 from the water supply reserve account to the Buckhorn District and Trout Unlimited for an irrigation efficiency project designed to reduce stream diversions. Um, this pro the project will pipe the JPO number two ditch, improving water delivery efficiency by 40%. In turn, the Buckhorn District will reduce diversions by 40% and will curtail all diversions if flows are below 1.25 CFS. Um, uh, to go back in time a little bit, on January 22nd, the board formed its intent to appropriate an in-stream flow water right on the segment of Abrams Creek. Pursuant to Rule 5D of the rules concerning the Colorado in-stream flow and natural lake level program, notice of the board's action was sent to the ISF subscription mailing list on January 29th. This notice provided all parties with the deadlines to file a notice to contest, which was due to the CWCB no later than April 2nd. Staff did receive a notice and contest from the Buckhorn District, Metro, Buckhorn Metropolitan District Number One, and Trout Unlimited subsequently filed for party status as well. So here you can see, um, just go back a little bit. So this is the entire pipeline that was that was piped, kind of cuts off a little there. And this is the little insert picture as shows the the pipe itself that they put in there. And so all the pipe has now been um, completed. So all parties met several times to discuss terms and conditions, and we even met once out in the field. This is a bunch of us out in the field just below the head gate um, in August to see the finished pipeline 
and discuss the operations of the new proposed Hegate. Um, eventually, all parties signed a stipulation, which we were able to post. Uh, we had Andrew post a Dropbox the Tuesday after the board memos went out, so hopefully everyone got a chance to look at that. Um, but if not, I have a copy I can provide. Then on September 11th, the hearing officer approved an unopposed motion by all the parties to vacate all future deadlines or proceedings, and she closed the case. Um, which brings us to today, where staff is now seeking final action on the Ingram Abrams Creek ISF. So I can answer questions if there are any, or I could move on to staff's recommendation. Any questions, Rob? Okay. So this is the same recommendation that appeared in your board memo, and I'll just read into the record. Um, determined pursuant to section 3792.102.3. CRS 2018, and based upon the recommendation of the BLM addressing biological needs, flow rates, reaches, and time periods, and a review of the data and other information presented by staff in the memo and orally, that this ISF appropriation, the amounts identified in the attached table, that A, there is a natural environment that can be reserved to a reasonable degree with the recommended water rights if granted, B, the natural environment will be preserved to a reasonable degree by the water available for the recommended appropriations, and C, natural environment can exist without material injury to other water rights. Two, pursuant to ISF rule of 5F, established January 22nd, 2018 as the appropriation date for this water right. And three, direct staff to request the Attorney General's office to file the necessary water right application and to include terms and conditions contained in staff stipulation with the district and TU in the water court application and decree for this ISF appropriation. All right. Thank you, Rob. We have a staff recommendation. Director Wells. I don't have any questions. But I would like to move um, approval of staff recommendation for item, must be 20, <laughs> for item 20 on the agenda. It's been moved by Director Wells, second by Director Dutton that we Approve staff recommendation on agenda item 20. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we shall proceed to vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. As uh, we mentioned yesterday, agenda item 21 was <coughs> taking, taken from the agenda. So we move on to agenda item 22. Financial matters from the construction fund. So, we'll, we'll, there he is. Come around the outside. We have Kirk. <laughs> Sorry. Kirk Russell, Finance Section Chief, Agenda Item 22A. Um, I, I, I want to share with the board um, how impressed I am with uh, with the staff of CWCB and, and certainly the board. Um, we have an opportunity with the, the funding side of things to do some great stuff, but uh, the talent across the board at CWCB is, is just amazing. Um, and I wanted to mention uh, again, uh, one of our own in the finance section is retiring, Steve Biondo, after 20 years of service, uh, working kind of behind the curtain with all the, the money that we have coming in and going out routinely. Um, we wish him the best in retirement. And we introduced at the finance committee, Lauren Miramont, who will be taking over that position. And uh, we look forward to working with her. The, uh, the finance committee met on uh, Tuesday, and I just wanted to remind everybody, either listening or uh, in the audience, that all of the decisions that will need to be made relative to the projects bill will be made at the November meeting um, before we actually move forward with the 2019 projects bill. And I think there's some, uh, some good stuff to, uh, to be had in that uh, projects bill from a funding side. So to the, uh, the uh, accounts report or the funds report, 
A reminder that the staff is currently working on the audit of the loan program, the construction fund and severance tax perpetual base fund. And the numbers that come out of that audit, they line up real close to this board meeting. And I was not able to access those numbers before, uh, before today. I think they'll probably show up tomorrow already. Um, so the starting numbers that we look at for spending money in this current fiscal year that exist at the top of the uh, spreadsheets that I handed out at the finance committee might be a little bit different when we get together in November. Uh, the items that I wanted to highlight in this, uh, the sheet that I provide looking at the accounts, um, currently we have about $3 million that has uh, either been awarded by the board in loans or will be awarded at this meeting. And we anticipate the ability to, uh, to finance another 22 million out of the construction fund. The same number in the severance tax perpetual base fund. After today's meeting, if the board approves all of the loans that are recommended, uh, which is about 15.5 million, there still remains about 54 million in that fund for new loans. Uh, we continue to invest money in order to grow the, the two funds to stay up with the buying power into the future. Um, and that's why those, uh, those loan amounts are made available like that. And you can see some of the non-reimbursable assumptions that we're making that will be pending the November board meeting presentations. And with that, um, I think I'll keep that relatively brief if, unless there are any questions. Any questions for Kirk? All right. Moving on to agenda item 22B. I don't have the memo in front of me, um, but I needed to update the board on uh, Two Rivers delinquency. Um, if you remember back at the previous meeting, we were in the process of collecting uh, the annual payment from the Two Rivers Water Company. And at the time I had indicated that staff was working with that borrower. I believe their payment was due in March. Uh, in uh, about May, early May, we sat down with them or communicated through emails at least uh, and broke their annual payment into four. And at the last board meeting, I'd indicated that we had received one payment. We were a little bit late on the second payment. Shortly after that board meeting, payment two and three came in. Um, and so we were actually a little bit ahead of that uh, negotiated um, payment process. And uh, as of last week, I received all but about $5,000 of their fourth installment. And so we are real close to getting, uh, getting full payment on that annual payment that was due back in March. Um, I know that uh, the Two Rivers organization has been looking for, a, for an investor and uh, they continue to ask questions of us what the balance due on our on our loan is and so we wish them well um, but i will continue to update you i don't know if if we get this final uh, portion of the last installment uh, before the next board meeting uh, consider all things good to this point and uh, otherwise i'll be back uh, talking further about uh, their repayment process so that's all i have unless there are questions on that agenda item any questions for Kirk on agenda item 22B? All right, thank you, Kirk. Thank you. Agenda item 23, water project loans. Jonathan. Sorry for the delay. Jonathan Hernandez for the record, um, CWCB staff, presenting agenda item 23, and this will actually be 23A, B, and C. Uh, these are three loan requests for one project, um, so I figured that one presentation is likely appropriate, and then at the end, it'll be three separate um, agenda approvals for the staff to um, recommend. So again, this is the Walker Recharge Project located in Division One. Uh, the borrowers is the Central Colorado Water Conservancy District. Uh, there are subdistricts of groundwater management, subdistrict, 
and their subdistrict of the well augmentation subdistrict. Randy Ray, the executive director um, of Central, is in the audience today, and he's available for any questions um, afterwards that the board may have. So again, just to, I think you're aware of who Central is, um, but again, it's the Central Water Conservancy District. They were formed in 1965. They cover approximately 750 square miles. Um, the, they cover Weld, Adams, and Morgan County, and overall their service area includes um, 210,000 um, acres of irrigated land. They have two subdistricts, each with their own augmentation plan um, for groundwater wells. Um, GMS was formed in 1973. Uh, you can see there they have 892 wells that are contracted under that augmentation plan, covering 67,000 um, acre feet of annual pumping. That is the maximum that could be allowed. Um, they do have quotas based on their water supply um, that will ratchet that amount down. And WAS, the well augmentation subdistrict, they were formed in 2004 after the collapse of GASP. And so they got those wells, um, 275 of those wells are contracted. Again, contracted acre feet of 15,250. That is the most that they could pump. They haven't been able to pump that amount yet. Um, WAS, for the first years in existence, had zero quota as they, um, WAS was getting their uh, water supply and their recharge programs in place. They've since been allowed um, some pumping. And um, the goal of all three of these districts and subdistricts is to get more water supply uh, to allow more groundwater pumping to support um, the agriculture. The location of the boundaries. So all three, uh, the biggest boundary is central. Um, that's the 750 square miles. Uh, though GMS is about the same. Um, in area except for the Lost Creek drainage. And then WAS is much smaller there, the red boxes there. Um, GMS covers a, um, it's more just land that it covers, a whole area that, um, that, that are assessed the taxes. WAS is specific to the land irrigated by each well. So it's not a overall um, district, if you will. So what this project is, it's, um, it's a recharge project. They are looking to divert waters in times of excess, put them into the recharge ponds. They'll be varied at different lengths uh, from the river, and those uh, accretions will hit the river um, in times of deficit, and they'll be able to use those uh, credits in their um, augmentation plans. The users of the project right now are purely central GMS and WAS, and they um, are looking to, Central does not have an augmentation plan, but Central does lease water to farmers and um, also to WAS and GMS. And then GMS and WAS will be using this water in, in their um, augmentation plans. They are looking at potential partners. Um, they've been in conversations with um, these that are on the screen. Right now, the partners are not in the project. They're looking at future phases of joining into this project as it gets bigger and bigger. Um, or if the timing's right, they might come in um, a little bit later. You'll see this project is um, about a eight year project. So they have time to figure out more uh, project partners that might help spread the cost around. This loan is assuming uh, the phase one and phase two is only funded by central GMS and WAS, and that is their loan request. They have filed in water court um, for this uh, decree in um, late December, 2016. Uh, so that decree um, is allowing up to four well fields uh, to divert in combined 50 CFS, three surface diversions to divert at combined uh, 50 CFS. They file for junior water rights for this project, um, and they'll, they're also looking at using water rights that central GMS and WAS otherwise own or control um, to be able to divert into this project as well. The recharge ponds will be up to uh, 30,000 acre feet, and um, anywhere from close to the river to about five miles out of the river. And so that's what the, their um, water court filing is laid out. Here's a zoomed in location. Uh, you can see it's just between Orchard and Wiggins, um, Highway 34 and I-76 where they meet together. And um, they're looking at diversions and well fields right off the river. And then this, this is the conceptual layout of the ponds that um, they're looking at building. Phase one will be a surface diversion and some ponds on the north side, a well field and some ponds on the south side, associated pipelines, pumps and controls uh, for those. 
Phase two adds on to that um, additional work on the north side, um, additional ponds on the south side. And it's kind of a build as you go. Um, even so far, that future phases are looking at, um, that's the yellow, is even building on top of that. So essentially, they start building ponds, connect them with the pipe, build another pond off that, connect that with the pipe. They don't have um, each pond exactly located. And so with final design, uh, final discussions with farmers, um, they will be um, still locating where each pond exactly is. The cost of the total project um, is 18, just a little, just a little over 18 million. Um, they've divided into phase one and phase two, um, about five and um, eight and a half million each for construction. Cost to date, Central, GMS, and WAS have put in about 1.4 million into this, um, acquiring the land off the river, um, doing some preliminary engineering. So future cost is 16.7. They were approved um, by this board um, back in November for a water plan grant um, to help with this project. And so they've received 750,000 of a water plan grant, and that's being matched also with a Bureau of Reclamation grant for 750. Um, just for information for the board, that grant has not been contracted yet. We're still working with Central to exactly identify what um, scope of this project um, that'll be going towards. It's likely it'll be going towards the first pipeline section um, partnered with the Bureau of Reclamation grant in the next year. And for all of this money, they're looking at um, 14,000 acre feet per year as available credits in the river that they can then lease out and use in their augmentation plans. And that comes about to be about $51 per um, acre foot per year uh, for the loan cost. So how are they participating? It's purely um, how much are they owning in the project. And so Central owns 15% into this project. They will be getting 15% benefit from the project. Um, they are the parent district. And again, they, were, they will be using that water as available lease um, their primary customer is their own subdistrict, GMS and WAS. However, they do have the ability and authority to lease um, to others. The Table 3 loan details show the loan um, that's being requested by Central. Uh, with the service fee, it's um, $2,272,500. And the annual loan payment and obligations are on the screen. And so again, for, their, for that payment, they're getting this water about $51 per acre foot assuming full build out of phase one and two. Central will be funding this through their water activity enterprise. This is the mechanism they use to run their lease program. Uh, currently, again, their primary customers are GMS and WAS, uh, which I kind of like because it's a very um, steady customer. And Randy knows the other people over there pretty well. So if GMS and WAS, they don't want to pay, Randy can talk to himself about it. <laughs> um, so they do have a steady revenue stream. There, there's no increase um, necessary to the lease charges that they have. Uh, they're able to fit this uh, loan obligation into their current revenue stream. Um, their financial ratios do indicate a strong borrower. WAS is participating at 20%, and so they are responsible for 20% of cost and will be getting 20% benefit. So for them, they're looking at adding about 2,800 acre feet per year. And for reference, that will equal about 18% of quota. I'm not saying the quota can increase exactly by 18, but just as a general reference, that's 18% um, of their contracted um, acre foot. Their loan they're seeking is um, 3 million 30,000 and their annual loan payment obligations are there. It's the same $51 per acre foot of developed water supply. They will be funding this through existing property taxes that they have. Um, they had a 2004 ballot measure that approved 39 million total debt. With this loan, they will have taken 22 million of that, and the um, the annual payment will be their mills are sufficient to pay this annual payment as well. And their financial ratios also indicate a strong borrower. GMS owns 65 percent of the project, so they're looking at getting uh, approximately 9,100 acre feet. Um, for reference, that would be 13 percent of their of a quota. They're seeking a loan for $9,847,500, um, and they will be paying that through new property taxes. 
Uh, so central is a water activity enterprise. WAS is existing taxes. GMS will be new property taxes to be voted on in November. Um, they are seek, they're asking the voters for 48.7 million authorization of bonds and the Walker project will be the first, um, un, first project under that new authorization. And their table five indicate they are a strong borrower also. Um, I will point out because Randy was nervous that the cash um, in that ratio showed weak. However, it's weak because GMS paid $7 million to CWCB earlier in the year, paying down um, some loans. So there's good reason this week. They gave us all their money. Um, so they're building it back up. Um, so all that to say, we're not concerned that right now they show a low cash. Um, they used all their cash very wisely, I think, in giving it back to us. Um, so in all the staff recommendation, th there's a lot of words on this slide, but I try to get like just one general slide uh, for the board to consider just in summary. Um, and I did want to highlight today that the approval will put this on to the 2019 projects bill. Each loan is under $10 million, but we felt as staff because the total is 15 million, it's closely related entities. Um, you know, it's one district and it's two sub districts. We felt that it's appropriate to go through the projects bill. Um, since it is over 10 million. Um, the Central and WAS, they have a standard contract condition that we put on loans when there's multiple funding pieces that uh, we won't start dispersing funds until each um, entity can show that they have funds available to complete the project. GMS's contract condition that's on the staff recommendation is that we won't contract with the loan until they have um, voter approval. And then to let you know if um, the voters decline that debt, what would happen is they would come back amend their financials, it's likely they would go through their water activity enterprise that is existing. Um, but they're choosing to go th first, trying to get, go to the voters to assess um, all land evenly, rather than um, put it purely on well assessments. Um, but that or something else will be their plan B that would come back to the board should voters um, decline it in November. However, um, regardless of the vote and how that gets worked out, um, approving today would put it on the project's bill and it would stay on this project's bill. And so it might come to a thing where it's, this um, loan is on the project's bill in 2019, maybe January we're talking about new collateral for GMS, get that approved and then project's bill and everything would still be going concurrently uh, for a July one contracting date for all three. And so that's a lot of information. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. And again, Randy is in the audience um, if you want if you want to ask him instead. But with that, you have three staff recommendations 20, for 23A, B, and C, and they each have associated contract conditions. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Any questions for Jonathan? Randy, would you like to come up and say hey? <laughs> Thanks for making your way over here, Randy. You betcha. Uh, thank you, Chairman Yon and the um, rest of the directors. I'm Randy Ray, the um, Executive Director for the Central Colorado Water Conservancy District. Uh, your staff has done an excellent job of portraying uh, this project and uh, also demonstrating the need. Um, I'd like to also highlight that between the two augmentation plans, there's about 30,000, 31,000 acres of land that's irrigated in the South Platte Valley solely with groundwater. So that's pretty important to us. And um, also with the, the shutdown of the wells in uh, the early to mid 2000s, we were fortunate with a lot of municipal partners and entities leasing the district and sub-districts water supplies, reusable effluent. But with uh, continued growth along the front range, uh, their willingness to provide long-term leases is getting harder and harder to come by. So. As you can see in the presentation, um, our estimated annual yield of 12 to 14,000 acre foot a year is gonna be a big shot in the arm. It could be very helpful. So, uh, The location of the recharge project, um, average depth of groundwater ranges from 70 to 110 feet below land surface. So there's ample uh, saturated thickness to quote refill, you know, so. We uh, do not anticipate uh, any issues with diverting 30,000 acre foot of water to the site. So, a lot of interested project partners. I think it's uh, 
um, as Jonathan showed you the list, it's a, if you build it, they will come kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They like to see us uh, get off and growling and I think other parties will file water court applications to utilize the infrastructure that we build and develop um, continued long-term relationships and partners with these folks on the South Platte. So we're excited about it. Uh, it's really gonna kind of pave the road for our future and I appreciate uh, the director's con consideration on the matter. So thank you. All right, thanks, and I'll Randy. answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Randy? Um, Director I'm Anderson. Just, I'm just curious um, uh, if the property taxes uh, weren't approved by the voters, do the other projects, can they move ahead without that um, third one or are they uh, separate enough that independent, I guess is what I'm asking. Good, uh, good question. Um, our intent is to proceed forward and uh, Jonathan laid out the phases. So our intentions is uh, we would build phase one and a limited phase two um, and fund the GMS portion solely off the well member assessments. And uh, preliminarily, we think we would have to raise our member assessments by about 40%. Um, those guys are paying $25 an acre foot for water at the well, um, they're only getting to pump half of that. So it's really 50 bucks an acre foot. So when you start ratcheting up the fees to the well owners and considering commodity prices and milk prices and where the cattle market is, it's gonna be pretty hard on them. So our plan, I think, to help address your question is we'll, we'll build it out in phases um, to the extent that uh, our membership can afford to bear um, additional costs. We did do a, a, a non-scientific survey. We did a mail-in survey. We sent out 9,500 um, uh, questionnaires, received back about 600, and it was a 74% in favor of um, this question. And so roughly 10, 10 million would go come from GMS tax dollars that additional funds would go to build additional gravel pit storage facilities and we got a whole plan in the works for uh, for the dollars so we're hopeful that the public is going to support us any other questions for Randy Randy I just want to say good job uh, you guys are moving and doing some things that the Chatfield reallocation and you know you're willing to go out and help your farmers get things going and I really appreciate it yeah. on the river and you've uh, under your lead that you've been doing really well to do that so between gravel pit storage and and this and Randy gave us a tour of this uh, site as I said earlier in my director's report so uh, the South Platte Basin Roundtable got to go out and look at this site so it's a good good site and it looks like uh, it's a great project thank you appreciate it director Ryan Thank you, Mr. Chair, and and it's not often that I I weigh in and comment on on uh, many of these issues in these meetings, but this one I do want to just mention that this has been uh, just such a difficult situation for Randy and and his membership over the years as we talk about these wells that have not been able to pump their full amount and and that difficult discussion that I've had uh, a front row seat or or maybe closer than that for, for so many of these years. And the, the answer is always so difficult. There's not enough augmentation water for these wells, and that's a, it's a difficult answer for the water users. And I just need to commend Randy and his leadership and the board and, and the membership for, for doing just what they're doing. They're, they're continuing efforts to find that water that will help them pump, and that's just such a, such a positive um, continued actions from what I see. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. I don't, I don't know if this, this also helps your projection. I know you have to project a long time into the future. Mm -hmm. And if you can't get those long-term leases, I think some of the short-term leases you can still do with municipalities. They just don't want to go out real long. And so this helps that long-term projection, which helps you uh, in your quota a lot. So is that correct? You bet. You bet, uh, Chairman Yon. Uh, the further away from the river in these uh, recharge projects, uh, the longer it takes for that water to migrate back to the river. So in, in essence, uh, some of these ponds that are four or five miles from the stream, 
uh, you know, the I think half of the recharge credits don't come back for seven years, eight years. And our projection models in one plan is six and the other plan is seven. So that's real important to have, quote, water stored in the bank. Mm -hmm. And then with the ability to re-divert uh, credits that come back that we don't need that day, the, the location is cited uh, to be able to let us do that. There's no intervening <coughs> surface diversions between the two. And so it's be a recycling project in lots of ways. And, and there's a lot of water that makes it down the South Platte River to the state line. You know, and this is one of those attempts to try to capture that, make, make good use of it. All right. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. And I know uh, Director Trick is going to have to recuse yourself from these three. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I would like to recuse myself from 23A, B, and C. Um, Central is a client of my law firm, so there's a conflict. All right, thank you. But I wanted to say thank you to Randy for coming down and making the drive and, and answering everybody's questions. So. Director Wells. I'm going to check in with Jonathan, uh, or maybe Laura. Uh, would it be okay to move all three at the same time? They are three separate items with separate recommendations, but is there any reason we can't combine them in a single motion? I believe we've always done them individually. I don't know if that's an absolute requirement. Make them oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Laura's not. Thank you, Mr. Jumping. Chair. <laughs> okay. I would like to uh, move uh, approval of staff recommendation for items 23A, 23B, and 23C. Been moved by Director Wells, second by Director Goebel that we approve staff recommendation on agenda items 23A, 23B, and 23C. Is there any discussion? Director George. In each case, there's a, a, a set aside that says additionally staff recommends following contract condition. I just want to be clear that the motion includes each of those statements about the preconditions as part of the motions word staff recommendation. All right. Thank you for that clarification, Director George. The motion does include this special consideration on each of the individual loans. So any other discussion? Seeing none, we shall proceed to vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Randy. We'll continue on with agenda item 23D, Arabian Acres, Metropolitan District. Get around. Okay. Arabian Acres. Rachel. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Rachel Pittenger, CWCB staff. I will be addressing item 23D today. Uh, Arabian Acres Metro District, the automatic meter implementation project. So this project is located in the South Platte Basin, kind of up there on that ridge in between um, the South Platte and the Arkansas. The total loan amount is 404,000. Loan terms are 10 years at 1.85%. Um, I have been working with Ms. Judy Bertrand. She is the uh, Arabian Acres Metropolitan District Manager, and she is with us here today in the audience. So the project site and the community is between Florissant and Woodland <laughs> Park um, in Teller County. Uh, you can see here from, from the figure that Highway 42 runs right through that 540-acre area. Uh, there are 150 taps. <clears throat> the district itself was formed in 2002, and the distribution system, the, the pipelines were constructed uh, sometime between 1972, kind of over the time, 1972 to 1979. 
And here's another district map. I just kind of wanted to, to show, um, this is the service distribution boundaries. So here you see the service area in yellow, just like the previous map. Um, the blue shading indicates um, the lots where uh, the district serves. Here is an image of the meters, one of the meters that the district is planning on installing, as well as an image of one of the homes in the community. So with this project, uh, it will provide new meter pits, uh, allow for the installation of new hardware and software, and a drive-by meter read base station. The overall project goals, uh, project purpose is to improve the water distribution system. And as a consequence, continue water deliveries to all of its customers. Um, project completion, uh, it, the goal is spring of next year, spring of 2019. So quick summary, $400,000 project costs with the service fee, 404,000, looking at 1.85% per 10 years and uh, brings the annual loan obligation to 44,624. Uh, there is no anticipated increase to assessments, and the collateral for this project will be the assessment revenues backed by a rate covenant. And that was All quick. Right. So if you have any questions. Thanks, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Rachel? The, in the memo, there was something about a DOLA grant up to 200000 Yes. Would that just lower our the loan that they would get from us? Yes. Okay. Yes. So in the event they don't get that loan, they still qualify for the full amount. Okay. So that's why we're going for the total okay. here in this presentation. All right. Any other questions? Director Goble. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. If there's no further questions, I move to approve staff recommendation on agenda item 23D. It's been, been moved by Director Goble since it's so close to his basin. <laughs> and seconded by Director Gallagher uh, that we approve staff recommendation on agenda item 23D. Are there any questions? Seeing none, we shall proceed to vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh. can I back up? Do you want to come up and say something? I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> okay, sorry I missed you. I should have invited you forward. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. So we'll move on to agenda item 24, changes to existing loans. Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan Hernandez, CWCB staff for the record, presenting agenda item 24A. This is a change to the existing loan to the Trenchera Irrigation Company for the Mountain Home Dam Outlet Rehabilitation Phase 3. And then just for reference, this is in the Rio Grande Basin. Uh, they're seeking a total loan amount, a new loan amount for $756,490. That includes a service fee. Um, and the loan terms <laughs> remain the same 30 years at 1.65%. Uh, Tracy Kester is the president. And he sent along Wayne Schwab, um, who was introduced by Heather earlier, sorry, Director Dutton earlier. Um, and he is in the audience and available for any questions um, after my presentation. So this was presented back in March. Um, maybe you remember some of it, maybe not. But as a um, reminder, uh, the Mountain Home Reservoir is located just southeast of Fort Garland. Uh, the service area of the Trenchier Irrigation Company is shown in the red approximately. Um, but they cover uh, 14,100 acres of irrigated land. The Mountain Home Reservoir is also location of a state wildlife area. Um, the reservoir itself holds 17,964 acre feet of water. Um, this is irrigation water um, for the district, or sorry, for the company. Um, CPW also owns a 653 acre foot um, conservation pool at this location. The original project was looking at the um, leaking valves and the inoperable valves um, in the valve house, which is located on the dam 
And the project original scope was looking at this red circle area, essentially from valve house um, downstream to the end of the outlet. They wanted to repair uh, the valves, put in some valves that actually work, which is a good thing. Uh, but also, um, it would also eliminate um, this severe leakage. The picture in the top right, all three of those valves are closed. Um, you can see the water is finding a way. Um, so they estimate that they lose about 2,000 acre feet per year um, over the winter while water just leaks away. They are also going to line the downstream of the, um, of the pipes downstream of the valve house, put in a new trash rack, and they were constructing um, here it says full reservoir, but they just want to construct under as much water as possible. Um, they didn't want to drain the reservoir just for this project. Um, it's a lot of good irrigation water and they didn't want to waste um, any of this water. So this was back in March and that was their plan. During the summer, um, they were seeing um, high water use out of this reservoir. They knew that they were going to be draining this reservoir uh, for irrigation water nearly empty. And so the company made the decision, let's go ahead and use all of the water we can for the irrigation. Um, you can see these pictures, which were taken last week. They were successful in doing that. Um, so now that they knew that they were going to empty the reservoir, it made them reassess the construction coming up ahead. And they uh, realized that one, without water, we don't need divers, we don't need bulkheads, so that's going to save some cost. But two, without water, we now have access to the, um, the pipeline upstream of the valve house. So let's go ahead and line those as well, add that scope. Um, and also a side note for CPW, CPW from the beginning always wished that they could get this reservoir drained um, be, to manage the pike that were um, living happily in the reservoir. And so this also uh, had a side benefit with state wildlife areas, CPW, in that they were able to drain this reservoir to help them manage um, the fish, which is, has been a long goal of theirs. And so looking at that same picture, essentially now they're adding the work in the green, which again is lining uh, the three um, outlet pipes. Um, and that's really the, the additional work. And so the project cost, they saved some money because they are doing this in the dry now. Um, they added some, the cost with the lining. Um, they've still kept in a construction contingent, contingency. So they have a, a bid from uh, Maltz that they've selected um, however, they still decide to keep a construction contingency. Um, they have finished designs, but they're working with the SEO on uh, final design. So just in case anything else um, comes up through that process, they'll have a contingency and won't need to come back again to the board for another hundred or so thousand dollars. Um, and they're looking at still constructing this um, starting in October. The financing of this, um, they had a few outside grants from just the local community. Um, they have a WSRF grant already approved um, for 513,000. And then the Delta for this project, uh, this increase is coming fully from this loan. Um, and so this is a 313,000 increase to their loan. Table three has a financial summary. Um, their new annual lo loan obligation will be 35,391. Um, this will add two dollars and eighty six cents um, to their um, to their assessments. Currently, their assessments are twenty three, and kind of most importantly, this increase um, their debt service has gone uh, from a dollar sixty six per share with the original loan. Now it'll be two dollars and eighty six per share with this increase. Uh, the ratios indicate that they're an average borrower, and the collateral remains a pledge of assessment revenues and the outlet structure itself. And with that, I will ask the board if you have any questions or you have um, staff recommendation. Any questions for Jonathan? Wayne, you sat here for two days. You should come up and say something. <laughs> <laughs> come on up. <laughs> Welcome. State your name and who you are. For with. the record, Wayne Swab with Trench Irrigation at Ablanca, Colorado. I want to thank the board for their help, the round table for their input and especially the staff for all their help this is a big project for castillo county or mainly uh farmers not much else income so this is a big help to us all right thank you thank you any questions for wayne 
Director Dutton. Um, I'm looking for the item. Oh, okay, here we go. It's 24. Um, I move that we approve staff recommendation for item 24A. It's been moved by Director Dutton, seconded by Director Goebel that we approve staff recommendation on agenda item 24A. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we shall proceed to vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Wayne, for making the trip. Agenda item 25, Colorado Water Plan Implementation Update, a highlight from Taryn. Good morning. For the record, Taryn Fennessy, CWCB staff. Um, I have the unenviable position of speaking to you right before lunch and right after lunch. So you're going to be hungry and then in food coma. So I'll keep this one short so at least you don't get hangry. This is an informational item only uh, as part of the Colorado water plan updates that you guys get at the board meetings. We thought it would be interesting to uh, update you on what we have done with climate change. As you guys know, climate change was a thread that ran throughout the Colorado water plan. Um, projections indicate that there could be serious impacts on our water resources uh, as our climate continues to warm. So we wanted to, to update you on where we are with that. So just a quick recap of the water plan scenarios. Three of the, three of the five scenarios rely on a perturbed climate. Um, these were developed through a broad stakeholder process through the, through the uh, IBCC and the roundtables in all of the scenarios that they developed. And what they ended up coming up with is uh, the two scenarios, A and B, that rely on 20th century observed conditions, that's what we've experienced over the 20th century, versus C, D, and E, which all have um, either hot and dry or somewhere between 20th century observed and hot and dry. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. So uh, in the water plan, we actually use those scenarios to run this through water models and see what that meant. In some of the most heavily appropriated river basins, that meant that under some of these scenarios, um, existing, de there would not be enough water to meet existing demands. Um, this was somewhat interesting in that we always kind of assumed we might have issues with future demands, but not necessarily existing demands. Um, that wasn't the case. But then when you look at river basins like the Arkansas in a single drought year, the calls go back, you know, to the 1860s anyway. So then it wasn't it wasn't that surprising, but I think it uh, reinforced the idea that we needed to be thinking about climate change and how it impacts our water resources going forward, and that the integration of this in the water plan was a really crucial element. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we've been doing with climate change at the state level uh, has been focused on mitigation. So there's two approaches to climate change. There's mitigation and there's adaptation. On the water standpoint, from the water standpoint, we focus a lot on adaptation. Um, but the other, the other way to address climate change is from a mitigation standpoint. So how do we reduce our overall emissions? Um, and this is a cross-agency, cross-collaboration effort that we've been working on at the statewide level. So last year, the governor issued an executive order setting forth greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. You can see the four um, primary goals of the executive order here. It also called for uh, the state of Colorado joining the U.S. Climate Alliance, and that has provided the opportunity for us to leverage uh, a fair bit of foundation funding um, and work collaboratively with 17 other states on initiatives um, that benefit Colorado. So one of the things that we've been looking at are, you know, natural and working lands and what is the role of soil health and cover crops. Um, obviously, there's a really strong water connection there as far as uh, healthier soils uh, and cover crops can reduce the overall need uh, or water consumption um, applied to those, those crops. So this has been a really great opportunity. We've been working to implement this through a number of different ways. Um, one has been working with local communities. In January, we held a symposium 
And we had uh, a number of co uh, local communities from across the state of Colorado come together. And the idea was really that we would work collaboratively with state and local government and stakeholders to kind of chart a path forward. So this wasn't just front of the room presentations. There was a little bit of that. And then we actually broke out into work groups based on sector. So there was a whole water track that ran for two days, um, really talking about how do we, how do we, address some of this climate change and water issues and what are some of the things the state can do to help local entities achieve their goals and vice versa. So the idea being that we're stronger together and that collaboration is the best way forward. Um, I should say that coming out of this, there have been a number of activities that have risen to the top as our focus and we are working um, working to launch a kind of cooperative effort among those local governments, the state government and the stakeholders going forward um, to kind of work and leverage uh, leverage opportunities that are already underway to make sure that we're not uh, we're not duplicating efforts and that we're um, building upon efforts that are already underway. Another uh, big component, so in Colorado, our, our two largest sources of emissions are um, power generation and uh, transportation. Uh, in May, uh, May of this year, um, the governor issued another executive order on transportation and electrical electric vehicles. This was following out of the electric vehicle plan that came out in January. That was another element of the, the first executive order. Um, and this is really looking at how we build out our corridors within the state of Colorado and how we incre increase the penetration of electric vehicles within the state of Colorado. So some of these things that we're working on don't necessarily have a direct tie to water resources, except that if we drive down our emissions, the idea is that we decrease that overall impact to various sectors. And the, the arguably the largest sector impacted by climate change in Colorado is the water sector. Um, so then, you know, what are we doing uh, in addition to this and why are we doing all of this? How do we put it to use? Um, at the state planning level, we're incorporating this into Swazi and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more, but that's a new effort. We haven't incorporated uh, climate change into Swazi in the past. Um, at the basin level, the water plan and some of the subsequent work that we've done um, provides kind of tools and resources and some modeling information on what climate change could mean at a more local level. And we have some more tools that I'll talk to you about uh, later in the next agenda item um, that will continue to help with that local level uh, and, and specifically with regards to drought. Um, and then, uh, and then kind of looking at what this means for flows and water modeling. Um, and then at the utility level, again, it's kind of helping folks understand what this means for them, how this can be incorporated into their, their planning efforts, um, and then trying to maximize uh, efforts underway so that, um, so that people can leverage the limited resources they have available. So what are we doing with Swazi? As I said, you know, in the past, we haven't previously incorporated climate change into Swazi. It's been mainly focused on population growth and demands. Um, but this time we are including it in, in to the whole Swazi process. Um, and again, it's gonna be a thread kind of woven throughout the process, similar to what we did uh, with the water plan. Um, and it'll give kind of a, a more plausible picture of what that supply gap might look like in the future. Um, it's going to build upon the past efforts. We've been working on this at CWCB for 10 years. Um, so building on the work that we did in the Colorado River Water Availability Study, as well as in the water plan, um, and then building on those five scenarios. So I mentioned earlier that there were the three scenarios, the hot and dry, somewhere between 20th century observed and hot and dry, which people have renamed as in between, which is much easier to say. Um, and so you can see over here, if I can find a pointer, no, oh, maybe not. Well, you can still see it even if I can't point. Um, you, the purple is kind of where we currently are looking at uh, this is essentially a, a, a water availability um, demand versus supply, but looking at current is up in the top in the purple dot, the hot and dry is down in the bottom, the red dot, and then the in-between is logically in between those two, but actually falls right dead center. Um, and there was a much more complex modeling process done to, to figure out what these were, and um, that's illustrated in both the climate plan and the water plan if you want more details. But this is the same methodology 
that we're going to be using um, for Swazi going forward. So it'll be consistent with all of that. Um, we're hearing that people have a lot of confidence in that methodology. And so we want to be consistent and build upon resources that people already understand. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so that was a really quick overview, but um, that's where we are with the, the water plan and climate change. And uh, with that, I'll entertain any questions you might have. Do you have any questions for Taryn? Director Hawkins. It's not a question. I just wanted to thank you for your work and emphasize how important it is to look at climate in our planning work, uh, especially for the southwestern portion of the state. Mm -hmm. I think we're looking at some potentially big changes down there and just wanted to thank you for making sure that the Swazi and the planning work is, is looking at what may come for us. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Taryn? All right, thank you. Great, Taryn, thank we'll you. See you after lunch. Oh, probably see you at lunch too. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we are scheduled for a break. We're a little bit ahead of time, but that way we can come back a little earlier. So maybe we can get back here like 10 till or so. Or Does that work? All right. We'll do that. Uh, so we'll break for lunch. <laughs>